Okay, let's get the show on the road. All right, good morning, everybody. How are you? That was terrible. Just, just awful. Really, really crap. Try again. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good morning. Oh, what is going on? Um, well, all right. Well, thanks very much for coming. We've got, what do we have, three hours? Something like that? Yeah. Three hours? We've got a lunch. Is that still 11-ish? Um, we have a break after about an hour. So around 11. Yeah. Yep. Um, we've got a break around 11, so we'll, uh, we'll take a quick break there. But we're gonna have, we have two sections to this discussion today, so we're going to keep in mind that around 11 o'clock we're going to take a break. So uh, th thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get going, before we get underway, we have a matter of very pressing uh, importance that we need to address. Uh, so if you'll indulge me, my friends, I need to, I need to get a photo. Now, when I say open source, you say open source, okay? Ready? Open source. Open source. Oh. Ah. So money. Good stuff. So, moving on. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Like I said, I've got uh, some code for you, my friends. I've got some code. I'm a big believer that if you're among the uh, four or so billion people on the planet Earth who are connected to the internet, then code, software, is the single most powerful thing you can do to affect change. And because I believe that, I start every single one of my presentations with a, a pointer uh, to a GitHub repository. I encourage you, however much you don't believe me now, I encourage you that uh, to, to, to note that code and then record it for your own reference later. Uh, you're going to want it later. Think of it as a, think of it as a, a, a life vest, right? You don't believe me, but you're going to be swimming soon. So, so note, that re note that repository, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'm also on the internet. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to, to, to correspond. If any, if any of you have any questions, comments, feedback, whatever, I'm happy to hear from you. So uh, by show of hands, how many of you are on Twitter? Twitter. Okay, that's, that's not nearly enough. Uh, the rest of you, get on it. Twitter's great. There's a, all, the, all the stakeholders and the, the drivers and the open source that powers your business today, they're on Twitter. They're happy to answer questions. It's the new IRC. It's a great place to be. I love Twitter and you should too. So uh, get on Twitter if you're not already there. Um, otherwise, what about email? How many of you have email? E email. Anybody? Nobody. Okay. Uh, that one's you know, if you, if, I'm happy to answer questions there as well, but re remember, if, if, I, if I help you with something there, nobody else can learn from it, nobody else can benefit from it, so it's a really greedy way of communicating, you know? Um, but either way, I'm happy to talk to you in either, either approach. I just prefer Twitter or Stack Overflow or whatever. A little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. Uh, I'm the Spring Developer Advocate on the Spring Team at Pivotal. Uh, I've been a, an open source contributor and engineer in several different open source projects, not the least of which are uh, Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, Spring Integration, Spring Batch, Vaadin, Time Leaf Activity. I am the, the number one, number one top ranked for seven years in a row, seven years consecutive and successive. Number one top ranked, highest ranked <laughs> contributor of bugs, but still number one, number one. No, more, more bugs per commit than any other engineer for seven years. So, you know, it's something. Um, I'm also a, a Java champion, which is a rare honor. It's bestowed upon those of us who do our level-headed best to engage the community and help them, uh, you know, level up with uh, uh, the JVM, uh, which I've done. And uh, that dovetails very nicely with what I do in my day job, in my capacity as a Spring Developer Advocate, where I do my level-headed best to help the organizations, communities, customers, etc., uh, work and, and build interesting systems, usually in terms of Spring. Uh, and as part of that, I've written blogs, magazine articles, books, etc., training videos. Uh, the latest and greatest of which are, of course, building microservices with uh, Spring Boot Live lessons, which I filmed with my friend, the one, the only, the inimitable Spring Boot co-founder and uh, uh, the amazing Phil Webb. And, uh, and my latest, uh, latest book, which is called Cloud Native Java. Now, for those of you who are wondering, and I know that you're all wondering because everybody wonders, this is a natural consequence of not having an idea, uh, that... That bird, that bird is a, a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a blue-eared kingfisher from Java in Indonesia. So you see, it's a bird that flies in the clouds. Birds fly in clouds, and it's a native Java bird. So it's a, it's a cloud native Java. No? OK. It's, it's fine. Don't, don't worry about it. it it'll, it'll come. Uh, anyway, uh, there's that. 
Uh, and I've also, uh, you know, as part of what I'm doing, I, I work at Pivotal. I'm very, very happy about that part, right? I'm, I love what we're doing at Pivotal. And we have lots of great open source technologies, and that's certainly interesting to us as well. And I love that part as well, uh, obviously. But let's be very clear. Let's be very clear. The open source technologies at Pivotal, how, how, however interesting, are not the reason we're here. They're not the reason that I'm here. It's not the reason anybody at Pivotal wakes up excited to go to work and to do what they're doing. You see, for as much as we love the open source bits at, 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 at Pivotal, and as much as we champion them, uh, as, a, as, a, as much as we invest in them, for example, in Apache Tomcat. How many of you know Apache Tomcat? So we are the lead sponsors. Spring, Source, and then VMware, and now Pivotal, have been the lead contributors to Apache Tomcat for the last decade. So if you've used Tomcat, you're welcome. Also, the same is true for Apache. You know Apache, the web server? The most widely used web server in the world? Yeah, you're welcome. That's us, right? Um, Cloud Foundry, RabbitMQ, and Redis for five years, right? These are all technologies that we work on at, at Pivotal. And, of course, Spring. So this underscores our commitment to open source and to building amazing stuff. But again, it's not why we're here. We care at Pivotal about helping customers, community members, and organizations quickly and safely move ideas, thoughts, value through the value chain as quickly as possible from product management all the way through to production. Product management, user experience, developers, testers, administrators, all the way off into production. And we see that a lot of organizations struggle with this movement, this progression. They struggle with how to move something as quickly as possible through that loop. They want to go faster, but they have trouble doing that. They don't really see how the they can capture that agility, and they know that agility is king. Speed is king. They know that the faster they can deliver value into the production environment where the customers can use it, the faster they can capture that value and turn it into profit. And we don't need to look too far for uh, supporting evidence of this. What is the largest taxi company in the world today? What is the largest hotel brand in the world today? What is the largest uh, um, video streaming, rent video rental service today? These companies have one thing and one thing in common. You see, they didn't have uh, more money, more resources, more brain trust, more intelligence, more anything, or even more time compared to the incumbent competition. They have the exclusive advantage of agility. They had the ability to have an idea, put it to work, deliver it, see it, see, see it in production, get the feedback, and then turn that feedback into change faster than the uh, incumbent competition. And they did so very well, very capably. You see, these companies realize that software is king. They have to treat themselves as software businesses. They didn't just compete with the existing incumbent competition. In the Bay Area, where I come from, they have a, a patronizing, I think it's a pretty patronizing, you know, uh, kind of word for this. They call it disruption, right? These companies didn't just compete. The ta your, your local taxi company didn't, doesn't compete with Uber. Or if it does, it competes in the same way that an ant competes with a, with a rhinoceros, right? It's not the same thing. So these companies have captured agility. They know how to go faster. They treat themselves as software companies. There's an amazing book. Have you ever read The Inmates Are Running the, Running the Insane Asylum? This book has a lot of great ideas, one of, which, one of my favorites of which is this idea that if you take any business, any business at all, and you mix it with software, what you have is a software company. If you take taxis plus software, you have a software company. If you take hotels plus software, you have a software company. The differentiator there is software. You're not going to get the same leagues of return, the same orders of magnitude of return by investing in the taxis. You're going to invest in better software to automate the taxis, to enable taxis. That's the differentiator. If you take any business at all, you get a software and, and mix it with software, you get a software business. And these companies have understood that. So they run themselves as software businesses. They deliver on software timeframes. They innovate on software timeframes, like a software company, like a Silicon Valley company. So a lot of organizations look around and they see this landscape of really, really fast, agile companies, and they understand that they need to go faster as well. And they struggle with this because they've got large existing applications. These, these organizations are lucky enough to have been around before the era of cloud computing. They've got software that predates the era of cloud computing and the economics of cloud computing. They've got large existing applications upon which a large group of people uh, toil. Large existing applications that are very difficult to change, to evolve, to, to, to uh, uh, update. And the reason is because it takes a lot of people to make any kind of small change, to affect any kind of change in these large, unbroken code bases, these monolithic applications. 
So these organizations understand the necessity. They understand that they have a need for speed. They understand the, the existential threat implied by those who have agility, but they can't quite get there. They're looking for ways to do it, and they struggle. They know that these companies, when they started, were very small, so they see that that's part of the, uh, the formula. They have to somehow think about small batches, work in terms of small batches. The smaller the batch of work that they have to push through the value chain, the faster they can go. But they don't know exactly how to take this large application and decompose it to break it apart into a smaller batch. We can turn to Dr. Eric Evans. Dr. Eric Evans wrote an amazing book called Domain Driven Design. Domain Driven Design has this idea of a bounded context. A bounded context is a part of the domain model that, when extracted from the larger whole, stands unto itself, internally consistent and reusable. A bounded context is a crispening, if you will, of parts of the, do of the uh, domain of an application. And I'll give you an example. Suppose you have two contexts, that of sales and that of customer service. Nominally, in both contexts, you've got this idea of a, of a customer. But is it really the same thing? When you, have, when you have somebody who's upset and they're trying to get money back on, cust on the customer service line, you have somebody who's already, who's already paid money and you've already got full inf account information. Compare that to somebody who hasn't yet invested and you're trying to incentivize to buy. You're trying to sell, right? These are not, these are not the same thing. They have different states, different life cycles. They have different uh, known uh, data sets. If you muddy the concept of a customer by trying to share the same entity across both contexts, you'll only, th only make things more confusing because that state will, that object, that entity will always be in different states. Instead, tease them apart. Treat them as two different things. Make clear that this is, the, this is somebody who's got a complaint and this is somebody who's a lead. Extract them out. If you can do this, if you can identify these bounded contexts, you have a, a, a boundary, a natural boundary, uh, along which to cut out parts of the domain. A smaller batch of work. A smaller batch of work upon which a small group of people can work. This small group of people thing is very important. You see, the whole point of reducing the size of the, of the context or of, of identifying these small batches of work is to reduce the size of the team working on it. That has extraordinary benefits, the most obvious of which is that it takes less time to, to communicate with everybody in the team about what we're about to do. Another benefit, of course, is now you can co-locate all the people involved in delivering that particular feature on that team which further reduces the time to deliver value. Because now, instead of me as a developer throwing my work over an imaginary wall and waiting for somebody downstream to test it when they have time on their schedule, now that person working in the testing group is on my team. He or she has no other priority but to test the code that we're working on in this, in this feature. Right? You've reduced the waste, the inventory, the queue time in between different stations in the, in the value chain. By doing that, uh, we go faster. Now. Uh, the question, of course, is how small should that team be? What does it mean to be small? Amazon.com founder Jeff Bezos talks about this. He calls this a, a, a two pizza box team. It's a team that's small enough that you can feed everybody on the team with two boxes of pizza. Now, I know, <laughs> I, can see your, I can see some eyebrows for unfurling. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Two, pizzas of, two boxes of pizza feeds a lot more people here uh, than it does in, in California where I come from. But, but in the States, when we talk about two pizza box teams, we're referring to about five, six, seven people, right? Very, very short amount of, very short, small group of people. The, the important part here is that you can keep in your head what everybody else is doing, right? You can keep the cost of communication down. And that is, after all, what we're trying to do here. We're trying to identify small batches of work that a small group of people can toil on and work on and push through the value chain as quickly as possible, independent of the rest of the organization, independent of other teams. We're trying to reduce the cost of communication and synchronization in an organization. That's, the whole, that's what we're trying to do here. We're, we're trying to build microservices. A microservice is a hack on Conway's law. It's an optimization. Conway's law, which, was, which originated in the 70s, says that software is a mirror image of the organizational structure that it serves. So if you have different teams in an organization that do a crap job communicating, then by definition the modules upon, these different, upon which these different teams work will probably have poor integration. They've done numerous studies, successive studies, to confirm or at least understand this, this effect, and they've done an example where they compared open source software to proprietary software. So two code bases of analogous function, uh, one open source, one proprietary, and they 
they saw that time and time again, the software developed, developed by the, uh, the people in the open source world tends to have better modularity, whereas the proprietary software tends to have far less rigid modularity in the components in the code. Can anybody, can anybody uh, hazard a guess as to why? Yeah, well, the, uh, the open source software is developed by people spread about the world, spread around the world in different time zones, working at different uh, paces, different uh, availabilities. So in the evenings, on the weekends, uh, uh, different days of the week, etc., whenever they can, right, maybe they're on vacation, as opposed to the people who are working in the proprietary software in the same office, in the same time zone, at the same company, uh, in the same geography, right? These people, these people are... Uh, Easy, they have an easier time of talking to each other. They can just turn their chair and ask questions of their neighbor and say, what do you think of doing this? Whereas with the open source people, they have less of an easy chance to do that. It's harder for them to all jump on a bridge and ask questions and to have a long discussion. It's harder for them to be in the same room, to have a brain set, brainstorming session. So the componentization is important because that becomes the communication channel. The API itself becomes a formalized boundary for communication. Microservices are a hack on this effect. We are making it easier for teams to go faster by formalizing the modulars, module boundaries between different components in a system. You get a lot of benefits by doing this. We get autonomy, we get the ability to go faster, but we run headlong into two big problems when we make this, when we make this move. Two big concerns that we have to address before we can uh, enjoy some of the benefits of this architecture approach. The first is, the first question, the first concern that we're going to have is how quickly can we stand up a production worthy service and all of that implies how quickly can we stand up a service uh, that is uh, destined to be in production that has the, uh, the, the appropriate infrastructure and middleware and you know load balancing and, and an environment and DNS and and, uh, how, qu and, and how quickly for the, can we uh, for that service also address non-functional requirements, things like security and observability, things that you need to do to ensure the proper uh, function of a, of a system in production, but that doesn't better differentiate you in the marketplace. It doesn't make you or your business uh, a better business, right? It's stuff that you have to do in service of, uh, of operations, but not necessarily uh, for the business. How do you do that? Well, that's the first question. How quickly can you do that? A lot of organizations struggle with that because most organizations that I've been to, and again, not yours, of course. Surely not yours. Surely not. But, but most organizations that I have been to have a terrifying, nightmarish wiki page. The wiki page with 500 easy steps to production. That wiki page is the enemy of velocity. That wiki page is all the stuff you need to do before you can stand up a production-worthy service. And it defeats our ability to go faster. It creates friction. And think about it. How hard is it for you to get a new environment right now, to get a new server, to get new databases? If it's, if it's a very hard to do it, you won't do it. I'm a, I'm a big believer that there's no such thing as a, a good person or a bad person. There are good systems and bad systems. And you are a product of the system in which you exist. If the system in which you find yourself makes doing the wrong thing the easy thing, then naturally, you're going to do the wrong thing. That's just human nature. It's the path of least resistance. Case in point, if it takes weeks to get a new environment stood up and new, new permissions and credentials and all that stood up so I can log into a machine and then deploy software, I'm not going to do that, right? I'll, just, I'll probably just take this existing uh, application that I've got and add more REST endpoints to it. Or maybe I'll shoehorn my data into the database that I've already got permissions for and credentials for. The right thing to do in this case is to factor out the code into a separate application, a separate service and to use a, a database that's appropriate for the task at hand. But it's so much easier to just shoehorn it into this existing code base and existing uh, database. And we see this time and time again. If, the right, if what you're trying to do is to model full text, then the right thing to do is to use a full text search engine, something like Elasticsearch or Solar. But we won't do it. It's so much easier just to make Oracle uh, you know, do some full text searches on their indexes. If the, right, if, if the right thing to do is to use a geospatial aware uh, engine, something that supports uh, geographic queries like Couchbase, you know, sometimes people don't do that. The right, the, that's the right thing to do, but they'll put it, uh, instead, they'll pay 90000 for Oracle Spatial because they've already got a license for that. Maybe you're trying to, to store data, binary data, 
right? The right thing to do is to use something like MongoDB's GridFS or to use S3 or a service that's optimized for storing bytes and scaling them out. But most people don't do that. They just, they just shoehorn it into Oracle blobs, right? If you're trying to model interconnected, interrelational data in which the relationships themselves have semantics, the right thing to do there is to, to use a graph database like Neo4j. But so often, people try and shoehorn it into uh, RDBMSs, relational databases, which don't actually have relationships. They have foreign keys to, to disk offsets and sequential disk-based systems, uh, which is the, how SQL and foreign keys are, are, are sourced from the 60s and 70s. If the right thing to do is to randomly lose your data at random times, then you should use MongoDB, right? But many people don't. They just try and use something else for that. Again, you have to, you have to care about the use case at hand, but it's so hard often to do that. So that's the first concern you're going to run into. The second concern that you're going to run headlong into is how quickly can we address the complexity that we've invited into our system? the complexity of building a distributed system, because now we've got lots of small interconnected services deployed across the network, across network partitions, talking to each other. And this complexity is significant. This complexity is very, very significant. And if you fail to address these concerns, you'll have a lot of pain. For if there's one thing upon which I'm sure we can all agree, it's that building distributed systems is hard. And so we need to ad address that complexity. So, to address the first concern today, we're going to look at Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. The, how quickly can we stand up production-worthy services, individual services, and, and the uh, corresponding infrastructure and middleware? We'll use Spring Boot for the, the application concerns, and we'll look at Cloud Foundry as a way of managing environments and, and so on. Then, to address the second concern, the, the complexity implied by moving to a distributed systems world, we're going to look at... Um, sorry, we're going to look at Spring Boot and Cloud Foundry, and then for the second concern, we're going to look at Spring Cloud. Okay? Now, I don't, I don't even know why this is, go away, shoo. All right, so we're going to begin our journey here to production on my second favorite place on the internet. Anybody know what my first favorite place is? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as often and as early as you can. It's great this time of year, especially. The weather's amazing. Bring the kids. Bring the family. Go as often as you can. I love production. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. If you can go to production, you should. But if you haven't been, then you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. If you want for inspiration in the early morning before your cup of tea or, or coffee, start that spring that I owe. If your children are restless and can't sleep, start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion and seek relief, perhaps after a long night of laksa, Start that spring that I owe. Bookmark it. Keep it close to your heart. Keep it under your pillow. Keep it near you at all times. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a very, very simple service. I'm going to call it the reservation service. And here we're going to take advantage of different technologies that Spring uh, supports, different types of workloads that Spring supports. Uh, we're going to use Spring support for building web applications. We're going to use Spring support for centralized configuration. We'll use Spring support for service registration and discovery. We're going to use uh, RabbitMQ for stream processing, Zipkin for distributed tracing. We're going to use the REST repository support. Uh, we're going to use JPA, the, the Java Persistence API, because I make poor life decisions, so JPA. And then we'll <coughs> And then we use H2, which is an in-memory embedded SQL database. Uh, and because it's an in-memory embedded SQL database, it's going to randomly lose its data after every restart. In this way, it's very similar, I think you'll agree, to, to MongoDB. Uh, we're going to also add Actuator for observability and operational concerns. And uh, that'll do. Now, I could, of course, elect to switch to the full version. If I switch to the full version, uh, I'll be given a veritable ocean of checkboxes, options, things I can elect to include in my application if I wanted to. And I, I'd certainly encourage you to uh, peruse this list at your own discretion uh, later on. But for now, it suffices to leave the checkboxes as we have them because that'll do. Now, 
you should see here all manner of different technologies, some of which I'm sure will appeal to you even as we scroll by them. So keep this page in mind. Like I say, lots of good stuff, okay? Now, you have up here three drop downs. This last one is kind of interesting. This last one is the choice of language. What language would you like to, would you like to use to build your application? Any language on the JVM that supports uh, annotations and objects will work just fine. So Java, Groovy, Scala, Kotlin, even Ceylon for the two people using that. It's just fine, right? Use them if, as you like. Anything will work. And here we have two more drop-downs, and this is where people get very confused. These are, you see, these are drop-downs, and they look like choices, but they're not actually choices. They're what I like to think of as non-choices. They're choices in the same way that stripping naked and running in traffic is a choice. You could, but, but please don't. <laughs> please. So, for example, in 2016, which version of the JVM would you like to use? As both 1.6 and 1.7 are end of life, expired, gone, no longer available, past their prime, not supported, not available for updates, extinct, deprecated. As both of these, for more than a year, that's 12 months in human time, if, as both of these are more than a year past being end of life, to continue to use either one is irresponsible and an active source of technical debt in your organization. To start new projects in 2016 on either one is insane. And WebSphere, by the way, is no excuse. So don't ever use these, ever. We also have the choice of packaging. And people get confused by this. They don't know when and where to choose which. So I'm going to do my level-headed best here now to explain when and where to use which. If, by some freak accident of physics, some terrible, terrible accident of physics, you find yourself stuck in the very, 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 very distant past. Far, 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 far beyond modern help. Then, then choose dot war. <laughs> but if you're here with me in, in 2016, which isn't even the future, really, it's just now, so it's not even that impressive, then, then choose dot jar. This is a big part of my overarching guiding personal philosophy of make jar, not war. And again, you have options. You have, you have choices. You should do what works for you. Now, I'm going to leave the options as they are because they suit us. Uh, and they're the right choices. I'm going to go ahead and generate a new service, like so. And I'm going to open this up in my IDE. And this is just a, a typical Maven Spring uh, application. Nothing all that fancy or involved about it. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, develop an application, a simple service. Gazoon. We're going to develop a, sim a simple service, and we don't really care all that much about the domain of the service or even the service itself. We just need something with which we can play and experiment. Can you all see that in the back? Should I make that larger? Let's see. Can you read that? Okay, good. Very good. So, so now I have a, a typical Spring Boot application. I've opened it up in the IntelliJ, but let's make, sure, make, make no mistake. It doesn't matter which IDE you use. How many of you are using IntelliJ? Very good. Good stuff. Hot sauce. What about uh, Eclipse? Some sort of flavor of Eclipse? Good stuff. Right. Well done. Hot sauce as well. Uh, what about NetBeans? NetBeans? Okay, well, that's great stuff as well. Works great. Uh, what about Emacs? Are you are you here, sir? Are you here? There you are. It's that guy. It's the one guy. He's in every talk I do. <laughs> I go to hundreds of cities every year, and it's always him, the same guy. I don't know how you do it, man, but you follow me everywhere, and it's getting a little weird. <laughs> every time I ask, who uses Emacs? He raises his hand, I use it, and then he leaves. He doesn't even stay for the whole talk. He gets on the plane to go to the next place. It's just terrible. <laughs> Troll. Anyway, I've got now 
my spring dependencies. Now these are opinionated starter dependencies. These dependencies give me everything I need to be productive out of the, go out of the gate or out of the box with, uh, uh, for example, JPA. This gives me Hibernate 5.x, JPA 2.x, trans transaction support, ORM support, etc., etc., etc. Now I don't have to work to make this uh, to line up the different dependencies. I don't have to uh, specify how to, you know, which libraries to exclude and which ones to include. It all just works. And if any library uh, shares a conflicting dependency with another library and there are different versions, we've made sure to line them up so that there's at most one version of any library on the class path, uh, avoiding all the painful conflicts that make using different components in the Java ecosystem so, so painful. That leaves me with an empty Java class, a public static void main class. Now this is a Spring Boot application. How many of you have used Spring before? Okay, some of you, good. This is a Spring Boot application. The Spring Boot application is in turn actually just three annotations. It's semantically the same as saying at configuration, at enable auto configuration, and at component scan. These are the same exact thing. Now, these annotations are standard Spring. This is stuff you've probably used, be used before in Spring. This first annotation tells Spring that the class on which that annotation is sat is a Java configuration class. So suppose I have class bar and class foo and suppose that foo has a dependency on or sorry, rather bar has a dependency on foo. Uh, I, can, uh, I can tell Spring about the arrangement of these objects. I can tell them about the wiring of these objects by saying return new foo and return new bar. And uh, the collaborating object, the dependency here that bar has on foo, I can express as a, as a parameter into this uh, bean provider method. So there it is right there. I'm telling Spring that I want the configured initialized instance that comes back from this method here. This is a bean provider method. And so I can inject this foo as many times into any, as many different collaborator objects and I only, I'll always by default get the singleton instance. I'll get one instance. Scope is still preserved here, right? Now this is one way of telling Spring about the wiring of the objects and this is based on the Java configuration annotation. That's this one right here. Another way to tell Spring about the wiring is to use annotations on the components themselves and this, uh, this tells Spring to imply the structure based on these clues that we're giving it, these annotations, these conventions. Now you can use either or or indeed mix and match both approaches. So you can say bean foo return new foo okay and we can say that this should be just a regular class without the component annotation and that will still work we've defined the bean here and we've defined it here right we've defined we've injected it into the collaborating object into the constructor so the wiring still works another way to get spring to see the arrangement of your objects of course is to use the the uh, classic uh, XML configuration format. So uh, if you have an XML application context configuration file, you can import that here and that'll still work as well. But I wouldn't use that, right? I, I prefer the Java configuration. And this finally is the thing that activates Spring Boot. It's what makes Spring Boot do what Spring Boot does. And we'll come back to it uh, later on. But so for now, it suffices to know that this annotation is a syntax shortcut for all those things that I've just shown you, okay? Now, with that done, we can build a simple entity because we've got Spring Data uh, on the class path and we've got Spring Data JPA. And I'm going to build a JPA entity here and I'll use a primary key that I'll signal is a primary key here by saying at generated value, at ID. And I'll give it a field here. I'll say private string reservation name. And I'll create some getters and I'll create a constructor and I'll create another constructor because of JPA, right? There's this. And I'll create a two string method and there we go. Now I've got a JPA entity. I've got a few fields that I want to persist into the database. I'm not really interested in the JPA entity. I just wanted something with which we can play. Uh, really, I've only got one field. Now, based on if you've ever used JPA, then you know this will get mapped to a column in the database called reservation under, underscore name, right? Res for reservation underscore name. And this will get mapped to a, ta a table called reservations. And I want to be able to read and write and manipulate instances of this entity, so I'm going to create a repository. Now, again, we can turn to Dr. Eric Evans, and, and we understand that a repository is a is an object that's meant to handle the boring, tedious, soul annihilatingly stupid creation, reading, updating, and deleting of entities. It's meant to interface with the underlying persistence tier, but it is by no means business differentiating functionality. It doesn't further your lot in life. It doesn't make you a, a better partner to your significant other. It doesn't make you a better person. It doesn't make you a better mother, uh, daughter, father, or son, right? 
it's just stuff that you have to do to talk to the database. So if you can reduce the amount of time you spend toiling on that to as little as possible, then you should absolutely do so. And that's what we're doing here. Instead of writing a whole repository, we're letting Spring Data do the heavy lifting for us. We're declaratively defining the repository based on convention. And we can see that um, Spring Data's JPA repository, for example, has methods like find all, find all, uh, save, flush, delete, find by ID, etc. All of those methods will be implemented for us automatically. We don't have to implement this interface. We'll get a bean that implements this interface for us. And we can, as I say, create methods by convention. I can say find by reservation name string rn. And this will turn into a query at runtime, something like select all from reservations where reservation underscore name equals rn. Naturally, I could override it. I could say at query and then pass in a custom query and that would uh, that query would um, you know override the default and I and, and you should if you want to, right? We're not trying to to position spring data as the lowest common denominator works on every kind of persistency or technology uh, abstraction. Instead, we want you to take full advantage of the lower persistence technology if you need to. It just suffices in this case that we can leave it as is. We don't need to provide the custom query. But if you're using JPA, then absolutely use JPAQL. If you're using Neo4j, then use Cypher. If you're using MongoDB, then use BSON. If you're using Couchbase, then, or rather Cassandra, then use CQL. Right? You should absolutely leverage the language uh, that powers your technology. You didn't invest time and money and resources just to treat your underlying uh, persistence tier as a, as, a, as a crud machine, right? Create, read, update, and delete. You want to do queries and analytics and take full advantage of the power that that thing has. So you can do that in these custom queries. We even support, you know, specialized kind of parameters. Suppose that we were using MongoDB right now. If we're using MongoDB or Couchbase, they both support geospatial queries. I can define indexes for, that are based on geographic indexes, right? So I can say, find by reservation name and point, and I can pass in for my second parameter a spring data geo point, right? So this would actually do a query in MongoDB or Couchbase that looks for the reservation whose reservation name equals this and whose geospatial index for point matches that, for example. So you can fully and natively exploit the underlying uh, technology if it makes sense to do so. Okay, now let's go ahead and sa save some sample data into the, into the uh, database so that we have something with which we can, we can play for today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build a command line runner. A command line runner is an, a callback interface in Spring Boot. When Spring Boot starts up, it's gonna call the, uh, the run method here. It's gonna call the run method uh, on this object and it's going to give us a chance to do any kind of application initialization. This is an ideal place to create or to, to, to put in um, application initial initialization, to put in uh, um, any kind of batch or ETL or messaging or integration logic that has to happen outside of the traditional request response flow of the application. Right? In our case, we're just gonna create some sample data. So I'm gonna say that we're gonna have a collection or stream rather of names. My name is Josh, it's lovely to meet you. Uh, what about you buddy, what's your name? How do you spell it? Name? Sorry? Name nice to meet you. What about you, buddy? A R U N? Very good. Nice to meet you. Thank you. What about you, buddy? L U N? Okay, nice to meet you as well. What about you, buddy? You, yeah. <laughs> we, we, I knew that. That one? Is that about right? Yeah. Okay, very good. I forget names. We've met before. Um, oh, let's see. Who wants to go next? Oh, I need another name. Wow. We have one, one woman? How many women are there? There's not, I need a woman. Is there a woman name I can use? Throw it out. Yep. How do you spell it? A D I T I. Very good. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Another one? Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm just going to call on you then. Uh, miss, over there in the far, far back. Yep. Hi. B E R O? Like this? Yes. Very good. Lovely to meet you as well. Uh, any more? Oh, okay. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, you know. Okay, I need more names. We can't just leave it at six. I need at least eight uh, because it's a nice, even, symmetric number and I'll sleep better tonight. Six is okay, but eight is great. Now, anybody, um, 
What about you, buddy, in the red shirt? Uh, Edward. What is it? E-D-W-A-R-D. E Very good. Lovely to meet you. And uh, one more. What about you, sir, with the, the, the skin that looks kind of like mine? Okay. What? No, right behind you. Although you too, yeah. What? Andre. Andre. A N D R E. Yeah. Love to meet you. And you, buddy. S H A U N or S H A W N. Very good. Cheers. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you very much for coming. That's that's enough names. I wish we could add everybody, but we don't have nearly enough time. So what we're going to do is we're going to visit every record in this report in this uh, stream, and we're going to save a record into the database. Then we're going to confirm the existence of those records by calling the print line method in the repository and then iterating or visiting every record that comes back and then printing it out. Now here I've used a, a nice feature in Java 8 called lambdas. Lambdas make it very simple to express uh, functions as a first class citizen, right? We can treat them like, like uh, objects, which sadly this actually does get turned into at runtime. So there's that. Anyway, um, we now have data on the uh, on the console in the database, right? We've confirmed that everything is working. It worked as we expected. Of course it worked. It was a demo. What were you expecting? It was always going to work. Instead, what I really want to talk to you about this. Now, this is the ASCII artwork in Spring Boot. This ASCII artwork took a long time to get right. You see, we have people on the Spring team that are doctors. PhDs. They work in nuclear physics in their previous lives. <laughs> very, 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 very intelligent people. If there's somebody who has a heart attack and somebody says, is there a doctor in the house? There's several people on the spring team that would raise their hand. It just wouldn't be the right kind. <laughs> the point is, it makes me very happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somebody got a GitHub issue that said, damn it, we need ASCII artwork. And I think you'll agree they delivered. It's absolutely gorgeous, very well done, very well thought out. Now, it's at this point that I'd like to take a brief moment to talk about what I consider to be a very glaring deficiency in the JetBrains IntelliJ product. For while I am a fan, I think this particular feature was poorly conceived. What the hell? <laughs> Why is that there? That's a dumb checkbox. And so I did what all people do when confronted with adversity and challenge. Uh, I went on the internet and I cried loudly. And I was given a message of hope, which I share with you here now. This is a message from my friend, Jan Sabron, who's a software developer by passion at IntelliJ Idea JetBrains. Here's his response. Don't worry, my friends. We're going to make IntelliJ great again. Now, a lot of times people ask me, how can I change the ASCII artwork? How can I override it? And even now, even as I pronounce those words, I resist the urge to start flipping tables and leaving the room. Because that's a stupid question. Know your station in life. Know your role. You're not going to do a better job than what we've already done. That's a masterpiece. But that said, I'm willing to concede that there are some very talented people out there and uh, anything is possible. So I'm going to show you how to override the ASCII artwork. All you need to do is to create your own banner.txt and put it in the source main resources uh, directory of your application. So here I'm going to curl a banner.txt into the source main resources directory of my application. Uh, and then I'll restart, having done all that hard work. Now, I think you'll agree that this is, this is better. Now, there's a few things we should focus on in this, uh, in this artwork. First of all, Meow. Second of all, and this is basically where we're here and why I'm so happy to be alive. Anyway, now we've got data being written to the database and we're confronted with an existential question, something with which I'm sure we all wrestled in university. If we write data to the database but we can't read it from a REST API, did we actually, in point of fact, write it to the database? And the answer is no, you didn't. So you could have skipped that stupid philosophy class. 
Instead, we need to build a REST API. And we could do this a few different ways. We could take the long way around by bringing in Spring Boot Starter Web like this, uh, and then go up here and um, I need to make my font a little, I need to make my screen a little larger, my font a little larger. Okay, close that. Font. Twenty-four. Can you read that? No. What did I do, <laughs> buddy? Was it something I said? <laughs> nope, I didn't work. I'm all out of ideas. Wait, we're in for president. By the way, he uh, he sat through my terrible jokes before, and got this talk, a version of this talk online in less than like something like I don't know, twelve hours or something like that. After I gave it at the Singapore Spring User Group, so I'm a big fan. I'm a big Wayren fan. Thanks, man. You're awesome. What did I do? He must hate my jokes too. Huh? My computer just re refreshed. Let me see. Displays. <coughs> uh -uh. Scale. Could, could you change it to P instead? Sure. Okay. Scaled. P. There we are. Now we're cooking. Thank you, we're in. Okay. So now, we could take the long way around. We could go back to our build and bring in Spring Boot Starter Web. And this allows us to, this gives us everything we need to build REST applications. And, and that works, right? By the way, can you see the font? That's what I meant to ask. Everybody, anybody can't see it? Okay. So we can take the long way around. We can build a, a REST controller. We can say reservation. REST controller, and we can inject the REST uh, uh, reservation repository, right? And we can uh, create an, a constructor and then inject that value into the constructor, create a new endpoint here, and then all we're going to do is we're, we're going to return all the records in the database uh, in this endpoint, and we're going to map that endpoint to HTTP GET value forward slash reservations. Okay, so that is certainly one approach to building a REST API, but that's an awful lot of code for what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to map the business state transitions, the, the very same st state transitions that, about which my repository is already aware to the appropriate and corresponding HTTP verb. So instead of me doing all that hard work, why, why not just let the repository, which already knows how to do that, let it do the heavy lifting, right? It already knows about the, the business state transitions. We're going to bring in spring data rest via the spring boot starter data rest dependency. And in so doing, we can we only need to add a, an annotation here, repository rest resource. And then we're going to annotate the finder method here. We're going to say path by name. And we're going to annotate the parameter. We'll say at param rn. And then we'll restart. And I will take some tea because I've earned it. Now, we'll go to localhost 8080 forward slash reservations. And we can see here a hypermedia API. Let me see if I can make that out. There we go. We can see a hypermedia API. We see the payloads, as one would expect. But then we have a collection of links. And these links are metadata. They're information about the response, about the REST API. They promote self-describing services. This is a, a design pattern called HotOS. Hypermedia as the engine of application state. It's the idea that every REST resource should have information enough uh, in the response for the client to be able to further manipulate that resource without any a priori knowledge. This is very, very useful in a distributed systems world where everything is an API. Remember, and it, remember, very, very, very few developers write good documentation and none read it. None. Zero. Nobody. And so the only humane thing to do is to make it as accessible as possible to understand how to work with and interact with a service. Hypermedia gives you that effect. You can see that this achieves two things. First of all, we've decoupled the client from the URLs themselves, right? The client doesn't care about reservations forward slash one. It cares about the link called self. 
That's the contract. So long as that link ID stays the same, then it doesn't matter what the URL is. And you're, you're probably used to doing this already and don't even realize it. So link href foo.css, type equals text CSS, etc. That is a link element in the HTML markup. It's a link element. The contract is the text CSS. The HTML browser, the, the browser doesn't have an expectation or an assumption that that resource is always going to be available at styles.css. It just looks for the link and then it follows or traverses that link. The link can change tomorrow. It, the URL, the resource, can live at foo1.css, but the client doesn't break. The same is true here with the, the REST API. This link, the URL, can change tomorrow, but the client's not going to break because they're only looking for this, the link ID. So we've now given ourselves the ability to change our API topology uh, over time. As our businesses evolve, so will our domain. And that's fair. That's, that's very reasonable. This helps you with a versioning problem, you know, making sure that as you evolve your system over time, you have flexibility. Another benefit of these links is that they give us an idea of state. Imagine you're on Amazon.com and you've added something to the shopping cart, something for which you haven't yet paid. Do you imagine for an instant that Amazon's going to offer you a refund? A button you can click to get a refund for products for which you haven't yet paid? Of course not, right? That's bad business. That's no way to run a railroad. We need to do better. They're not going to give you a button for a refund until you've paid, until you've checked out. Similarly, once you've checked out, there's no button to pay for products, right? You can't, like, check out again. This is state. This is contextual. In the same way, these links are contextual. You can dynamically contribute or uh, remove links based on the state of the resource. If you have a, a product in a shopping cart, you might have a, a checkout entity or you know, a cart entity, and you can uh, change it. You can change the status by posting to it. But that entity won't be there if the product's already paid for. Now the client doesn't have to remember uh, a prior, uh, you know, beforehand or a priori which endpoints to call in which order. It's all explained. The navigation, the navigable state transitions are given to you by the API. This is how you impose state in an otherwise stateless architecture. This gives you a lot of flexibility in a distributed systems world. Now, this also gives us some other niceties, right? I can scroll down and I can see that there's a, a search link and the search link has an endpoint here uh, for search and I can go to the search endpoint and it says that I've got one particular finder method called by name and if I click on reservation search by name, uh, rn equals and uh, I'm going to find one of my friends here, we are in the, the champion uh, and I then do a search for we are in and we find the result, right? So there we go, that search endpoint gives us what we want out of the box. Um, I can even do paging. I can say page equals one and size equals two, for example. And if I do paging, I get that for free, right? So there's those two records and contextual or stateful metadata, links that tell us the navigable state transitions from here to there. I can go to the first page of results, the previous one, the current one, the next one, the last one, etc. And we can do get, put, post, delete, etc. So this is all being powered by Spring Data REST which is in turn using Spring Hati OS to describe the, the resources, the envelope objects that are uh, embodied by this JSON here. Let me uh, expand that. Can you see that box boundary there? There's a box. That box, uh, the contents of that box is mapped more or less back to an, an object called a resource of T. So a resource object in a, a resource object in a, uh, in in Spring Hot US is an envelope object that has a payload and a collection of links. We'll see that later, so keep that in the back of your head. But Spring Hot US in turn builds on Spring MVC. All right, so now we've got a nice simple API. Are we done yet? Can we go to production yet? Are we done? Are we, are we finished? Can we ship it? Not yet, right? There are things that we need to do now that we've built a very simple service. Uh, we need to do in the service of operations, in the service of these uh, observability requirements and maybe security. These are things that we can't ignore much though we'd like to. Even though they're not glamorous, they still need to be done. Observability in particular is something I want to touch upon. We need to make sure that this application can express itself. You see, your application, when it's deployed into production, doesn't give off a telltale smell, it doesn't give off a telltale sound that, that tells you that the application isn't working. It's not like a car engine where you can hear the, 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 the whir of the engine and you can hear a, a, something that alerts you as to a problem in the engine. It's not like a, a food where the, the smell tells you something is wrong. It's completely silent. You need to give, make your application explain itself. And who better to, 
to identify problems in an application than the application itself. So we're going to stand up endpoints that surface information about the application by using the Spring Boot's actuator subframework, or the framework inside of Spring Boot called Actuator. Actuator is inspired by Google's Borg monitoring approach to infrastructure and uh, monitoring. The, the idea that, uh, the, the thing that Google does is that for every workload, for every service, for every process, they have in that process HTTP endpoints that surface information about that process. Even if the workload itself isn't HTTP, they'll have HTTP endpoints. So it might be machine learning or a batch or integration or something that has nothing to do with HTTP, but they'll still have a web server that's, that stands up and exposes this information. That's what we're doing here. So by adding Actuator, I can now uh, drive some traffic. Let's do some traffic here. One, two, three, etc. Do a search if I want, right? And now I can go to metrics, M-E-T-R-I-C-S. If I go to metrics, I can see an enumeration of uh, quantifications of the different stat states of the application. How much memory I've got, how much is free, the processors, the uptime, the, the, uh, the heap, the non-heap, the threads, the classes loaded, the data sources, the, uh, etc. I can even see down here, counters. This counter says that I've made one request to four size reservations and I had a status code of 200. I can see here that I made one request or three requests to reservations forward slash one, two, three, and I had a status code of 200. Now you may be wondering about the distinction between a gauge and a counter. You see, Spring Boot knows about two special kinds of metrics. These other metrics are uh, ad hoc pu public metrics, but Spring Boot has two very, very interesting specific types of metrics that we can use. The first kind of metric is a gauge. A gauge is a metric that you can calculate on demand. You don't need to tabulate the information over time to arrive at the value that you're going to then report in the metric. How much RAM do I have right now? I don't need to keep a counter to ask for each megabyte. I can just ask the operating system, how much RAM do I have? That's a, that's a gauge, right? How many, how many users are in the chat room right now? I'm not going to do an increment or decrement. I'm going to just say select count from chat room, right? On the other hand, a counter is something where you're tabulating the number over time. How many users have checked out? For each new checkout, I say plus one. Right? There's one more HTTP request, plus one. There's one less job in the task queue, minus one. Counters are incrementing and decrementing metrics. How they're, how they're arrived at is different, but the result ultimately is the same. You have a key and a set of numbers. These metrics are interesting because they give us information about the application. You can, of course, inject the counter service and the gauge service in your own code and use that to capture or emit custom metrics. If you do that, if you do that, uh, you can add business metrics or PKIs, product, uh, sorry, um, yeah, key, performance key indicators, right? You can add these things into your own metrics and capture them and use that to drive insight, but you can't really do a good job of that without one very important thing. You see, we don't have any context for these metrics. We don't have any idea of whether these metrics are an improvement or a deterioration. We don't know that because we don't know what these values were before. These metrics lack the ever so critical dimension of time. Without time, we have no basis for, for understanding whether these are, are better or worse, good or bad. Without time, we can't see patterns. And if we can't see patterns, then we cannot make predictions. These numbers are at best a latest and greatest reflection of the point in time value that they most recently had. That's not good enough. And we can capture time by using a great library by a guy named Coda Hale. How many of you know Coda Hale? Coda Hale is one of my friends and spirit animals. This is Coda Hale. I share him with you now. Gnoming pretty hard right now. Dum dum. Dum dum. Boop. That's Coda Hale. Also, this is Coda Hale, and I want to take a moment to really focus on, on this photo. Now, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on. I get that you're overwhelmed by the awesomeness of it. First of all, first of all, notice how both master and dog are intently focused on the code. <laughs> Notice how the dog's ears are up in tension. 
his priorities are clear. He, he's, he's listening for feedback. Do you see their, their pair programming? Notice how both are dressed for the occasion. They both understand the task at hand, and they both came in pink. And notice that amazing hat. The hat wind. So this is Coda Hale, and I, I show you these photos so that you'll remember them, because you're still going to use his library because it's that good. And then you're going to know that Coda Hale's code is all up in your production systems, operating your banks, operating your governments. That's this guy. And you're going to feel better about the world. So he created this library called the Drop Wizard Metrics Library. And if you have it on the class path, it integrates seamlessly and automatically with Spring Boot's actuator framework. If you use it, you can capture a third type of metric beyond a counter and a gauge, a third kind of metric called a histogram. A histogram is a statistical structure that captures things like the mean, the median, the max, the average, the uh, minimum, the, the 95th percentile, the 99th percentile, the 99.9th percentile, the 99. You know, 95th uh, 99.99th uh, percentile, etc. It captures all sorts of uh, calculations, statistics about each of the metrics that it sees. But it does this uh, by using something called reservoir statistical sampling. That is to say, it doesn't keep every metric that it sees over time in memory. It recalculates the value as it moves forward in time. This means that the values that you see captured are necessarily a little bit lossy. They cannot be accurate, right? You can't get an accurate average unless you have all of the data points in the, in the set. But you can get a good enough average. And they do some pretty sophisticated math to do that work for you. The benefit, of course, is that you don't have every single metric in your system inside the memory pool of, your each, of each application, which means you don't, you don't run the risk of overwhelming the RAM buffers in your machine, which is very, very useful in a production system. That's very, very powerful because you have an at-a-glance idea of whether the number you're looking at, the metric you're looking at, is uh, about the status quo or if it's a complete deviation from the normal, right? Now, sometimes it can be very useful to look at all the values. Sometimes it can be very useful to have all those values so you can do querying or an analysis on those values. And for this, we can use the Drop Wizard Metrics Library's various, uh, various um, reporter objects. These reporter objects let you talk to downstream um, um, time series databases, tools that want to help you understand and graph and work with this data. Most of these time series databases uh, speak a particular protocol called STATS-D. STATS-D refers to both a daemon and a protocol. And while, while very few people use the daemon, the protocol itself is becoming ubiquitous. It was developed by Etsy. It's a way of shipping, or it's become a de facto standard for shipping metrics. And so you can use the Drop Wizard Metrics Library for shipping StatsD metrics to time series databases. A time series database is another type of database that isn't Oracle. It's optimized for storing keys and values over time, in the continuum of time. And once you've got it, you can then use tools like, uh, once, you've, once you've got your drop wizard metrics reporter, rather, you can then use tools or time series databases like InfluxDB or Prometheus from SoundCloud.com or OpenTSDB from StumbleUpon.com or uh, uh, Graphite or Ganglia or the newly announced React TS or time series from the people that make React at Basho. These tools are all optimized for storing large amounts of data over time, and then you can use tools like Grafana to graph that data. This is Grafana. It gives you the ability to drive that ever important single pane of glass dashboard experience that is critical to a, a production system. You see, a cloud native system is four things, and we're going to touch upon these points over and over and over again for the next, you know, next little bit of time that we have together today. Uh, a cloud native system is one that, is, uh, that lends itself to easy and agile evolution and iteration. A cloud native system is one that benefits from the elasticity and dynamicism of a cloud environment scaling out. A cloud native system is one that does the right thing in the face of service outages and topology changes. And a cloud native system is one that is observable, that is to say, it's monitorable by its outputs. So the actuator speaks to and helps us with that last point. It specifically helps us understand the state of each individual node in a system. Right? The metrics endpoint is only one of the many endpoints that you can use in the actuator. There are others. There's ENV, for example, which uh, doesn't work because my application seems to have been, oh, wrong port. Ha <laughs> ha. There's ENV. ENV is, in, is the environment. It's a, 
the system properties and the environment variables for this application. You can see, however, that sensitive information like my underscore passwords and my underscore key and my underscore secret, those are all uh, obscured. They're, ha they're, they're masked. I've also got uh, mappings, which shows me all of the endpoints uh, available to HTTP that are, that are stood up by Spring, as well as any metadata if available. So I've got an endpoint at forward slash heap dump that responds to HTTP git that produces an applic application octet stream. I've also got trace. Trace shows me the last 100 requests that have been made into the application by default, and their headers and their timestamps and so on. Right? This is great for in debugging interactions between uh, Java JavaScript uh, and services, for example. It's great for uh, security, uh, pr uh, handshake exchange information. You know, just great for a lot of stuff. Okay. There's also info. Now, info is empty by default. It's up to you to customize it. There's a lot of useful things you can put here, namely ser identifying information, things you can use to identify which service is running in production. When you move to a continuous delivery pipeline, there's the possibility, the, the, the wonderful possibility, that every git push could trigger a build that will ultimately result in a build that will go through an exhaustive uh, test suite harness that will then deliver something into production. That's a very, very powerful thing. But it means that every git push could be something in production in 10, 20, an hour, whatever. If that happens, it becomes very important to be able to identify the version of the code that's in production. Because you might have 10 new versions in a single day, or 100. So you might put, for example, the, the git commit ID using Maven resource filtering. You can, you know, at compile time, you can copy a value into a property file and then have that included into the application. And there's actually a documentation on how to do that with Spring Boot in particular. Now you have an identifier, so you can use to understand which version of the, the code is in there. And of course, there's my favorite endpoint, health. Now, health tells me, it gives me an enumeration of the different health indicators in the application. It tells me information about different subsystems in the application. I've got, for example, data source, and the data source has uh, got a connection pool, and the connection pool has a, a validation query, and the validation query is something like select one from dual or whatever. I can see the results here. So very good. Now. I may want to customize these management endpoints. I may want to, for example, contextualize and move everything under forward slash admin. And I may want to also create my own health indicator. So I'm going to go back to Spring Boot and I'm going to show you a, a few ways by which we can extend or override the default behavior. The first is to go to source main resources and uh, use any of the well-known properties to which Spring Boot will respond to change or def override the default behavior. I can see, for example, that management.contextPath is useful for prefix or, or contextualizing the management endpoints. If I go to my code, I can also create a custom health indicator. So I can say class custom health indicator implements health indicator. Okay. So this is just a simple health indicator. It's an object of a well-known type that will get plugged into the machine the, as a cog in the machine, so to speak. So I'm going to say return health dot what? Health dot out of service? Surely not, Singapore. Never. Down? I don't even know what that means. So we're going to say we're either we have a status or we're up. Always, right? Like Chuck Norris. So I'm going to say I hard locks. Okay? Uh, and then we'll say dot build. Or actually, I'll just say out of Singapore. And it's food. Okay? So now I've got a custom health indicator. Let's go ahead and restart. <coughs> and we'll see here that this no longer works, right? I've changed the management endpoints to be forward slash admin. So there's that. And if I go here, I can see that there's a custom health indicator there as well. Status, iHeart Singapore, and it's food. And that works. This health indicator also returns the right status code. So if any of these components says down, then this will say down. If that says down, then the status code will be 500. But it's, it's 200 otherwise. Now, this isn't the only way by which I can access this, this information. You can also use JMX, for example. JMX is uh, super, super convenient if you um, already have it in your environment. So we already exposed that information for you via the uh, JMX endpoints here. So there's my health endpoint, operations, get data, and there's my custom health indicator, iHeart, Singapore, and it's food. That, that's, that sh this should reinforce the idea that these actuator endpoints are, they have uh, an endpoint object and then they have different views for that data. So JMX, REST, etc. 
In fact, one of my favorite views or representations of that data is the Spring Boot remote shell. So I'm going to add this here for you now. So Spring Boot starter remote shell. I'm going to restart. And now what it's going to do is it's going to start up and absent any specific configuration with Spring Security, it's going to print out a user on the console that we can use. Now I haven't used Spring Security. I haven't told it about my identity provider. So it's going to give us a username and password. The username is called user and the password is called uh, this right here. And once I've got that, I can SSH into it. So SSH minus P 2000 user at 127.0.0.1 paste paste the password, enter. Good ASCII artwork, that's important. Very well done. And now I can say, show me some help. And I can say, oh, system prop ls. Or show me the metrics. And my, my hands aren't on the keyboard, but you can see these numbers are animating. They're changing without me up to, uh, touching them or you know manipulating them. Uh, I can use the endpoints. I can show endpoint list, endpoint invoke health endpoint, right? And if I do that, I can see I heart Singapore and its food, right? My favorite Spring Boot remote shell thing is the dashboard. The dashboard is basically Java top. It shows you the running processes in the application, as well as the meta, you know, the memory pools in the application itself. Now, this is the meta space for for Java eight. But if you're using a uh, Java six or seven, which you're not supposed to do ever, then it'll show you perm gen, right? Okay, so hopefully you see that the actuator is really, really powerful. There's a lot of extensive things you can do there. And you, you, sh you should see by now that I've been able to change little things here and there and get useful results. I've been able to override the defaults without having to tear down the whole object graph. This is what Spring does best. Spring, at the end of the day, is a framework. The Eiffel, in the Eiffel sense of the word, it is open for extension but closed for modification. Although, since it's open source, it's not actually closed for modification. It's just that you don't need to recompile Spring to observe different behavior in Spring. You can plug in components at well-known places and see that in action. This mechanism in Spring Boot is powered by something called, by something called uh, auto configuration. When Spring starts up, it looks on the class path for a text file in various meta inf jars. And it looks in the class path for a sp text file called spring.factories. For example, here's the spring.factories for the auto configure jar in my application. And you can see that it says org spring framework boot auto configure enable auto configuration equals and then it has a long long list of java configuration classes. These java configuration classes would seem to do just about everything. There's AOP, RabbitMQ, batch processing, cache support, Cassandra support, couch based, you know, liquid based, elasticsearch, mongodb, solar, neo4j, redis, uh, hazelcast integration, jdbc, jms, jmx, jta, jndi, database migrations with flyway and liquid base, JOQ, Java Mail, mobile, mustache, security, different types of templates, uh, social network integrations, etc., etc., etc. Everything. And at first blush, that might be a little bit terrifying. It certainly was for me when I saw that, because I know that Spring is going to try and run every single one of these classes when the application starts up. And I certainly hope I don't have all of these libraries on the class path, right? That wouldn't be very good. So we can take a look at one of the examples to kind of understand what's happening. This is the RabbitMQ auto configuration. It's just a configuration class. Remember we talked about configuration classes before? It just defines beans, but these beans are conditional. They're based on certain conditions. So here we're saying, I want to create this bean, this configuration class, but only so long as the type rabbit template.class or channel.class are on the class path. If they're not there, then don't bother evaluating all of this configuration. Short circuit the evaluation there. Similarly, I've got a bean here, I've got a configuration class, which defines a bean of type connection factory, a RabbitMQ client connection factory. But it does so only if the bean isn't already defined, if the bean of that type isn't already defined. We don't want to define two of them. If, you've, if you feel like you can do a better job and you've got some particular thing that you want done in your connection factory, then we'll defer to you. You know best, right? But if you want Spring Boot to do it, we'll do our best to do the, the, give you the default version, right? And we can do a lot of things with just properties. You see, earlier I showed you that when I use uh, application.properties, I can change everything. I can change my port. I can change RabbitMQ, uh, you know, this is the RabbitMQ addresses. Well, RabbitMQ addresses, if I click on this property, you can see that it actually goes, it corresponds to this property on Rabbit properties. 
which is the object that I was just looking at in my Rabbit Auto, Confu Rabbit Auto Configuration. That's this right here. Spring Boot, when it starts up, it looks at your properties and it maps them to fields on these POJOs, these configuration property style objects. Here it's saying anything that starts with spring.rabbitmq.host will be mapped to this field. Spring.rabbitmq.port. Spring.rabbitmq.username. Spring.rabbitmq.password, etc. The effect is that you now have the ability to build uh, applications and get useful defaults that you can easily override. You've seen this several times today. I added Spring Boot Start a Web, and I have an embedded web server in, in Spring MVC and the servlet infrastructure. I had to do nothing. There's not even a web.xml in there. I added Spring Boot Start a Data JPA, and I got transaction support. I got a local container entity manager factory bean uh, for my entity manager from JPA. I've got the transaction support. I've got all the SQL and, and you know all that stuff set up for me. When I, when I used Actuator, I got observable operational endpoints in the application. I did nothing. I just added libraries to the class path, and that activated these tests. And you can do the same thing. If in your organization you have things that need to be the same from one service to another, maybe you've got security, or maybe you're doing something with a framework that we don't already have an auto configuration for, describe it once. Get it right just once. Put it in an auto configuration. And remember, you can auto configure servlets and filters too just as regular beans. You just say at bean and then define javic servlet filter or javic servlet servlet, right? Um, you define that bean just once and Spring will automatically install it for you when it's on the class path if those tests are true. And you can say, okay, I'll, do the, I'll provide the default bean, but maybe the, the user of my framework has some particular thing that they want to override and they can either use your custom properties, your custom configuration properties, or they can just define the bean wholesale and you can have a test for that bean's presence. This makes it very easy to build systems on this dynamic sort of uh, adaptive approach to configuration. Indeed, you can build your own Spring Initializer. Remember the Spring Initializer? My second favorite place on the internet? Start.spring.io? That source code is open source. The application itself is open source. So you can fork it on Spring-io Initializer. Now you can have a start.yourorganization.io. Add custom checkboxes. Maybe you're doing SiteMinder or something like that, and you want to configure that to work a certain way. Describe that auto configuration once, package it up, and make it a standard for all new microservices that when you go to start.yourorganization.io, start that that checkbox is automatically added to the build. Now you have the ability to get past those non-functional requirements. Now you can remove the cost of getting past those 500 easy steps to production. Right? Now you can focus on writing the business differentiating functionality that you set out to write in the first place. Now, we have an application. And this application is ready for production. It's production worthy. And, and one question we have now, of course, is what does it mean to make this a production application? Well, first of all, you should know that this is a, a so-called fat jar. So downloads, reservation service, maven, minus D, skip tests, Clean, install, crack the neck. <coughs> and now I want to go to the uh, target directory. Do minus HS, jar. There's my 39 megabyte jar. That jar is a so-called fat jar or, you know, American jar. That jar has everything that we need to be able to run this application. It's self-contained. I can add this jar as an attachment to an email. I can send that email to my dear sainted grandmother. And my grandmother is really, really smart, but she's just not really conversant with computers. However, she can still run this. She's got applets on her machine. So she can get to production very fast. If you have a, a, a WebSphere addled operations team that insists on using that, tell them to call my grandmother. She'll help them get to production faster. So Java minus jar, reservation service dot jar. There's the, the application, really good quality animated, or sorry, ASCII artwork, and the application's up and running. Getting the application up and running isn't the hard part, of course. Right? We have other concerns related to, for example, how do I do load balancing? How do I provision an environment? How do I handle DNS and all that? And for this, a cloud computing technology like Cloud Foundry is, in, is uh, uh, invaluable. So I'm going to do CF login. It's going to log into my part, the, the particular Cloud Foundry uh, installation that I'm using, but you can log into your own, of course. I'm going to log in here. I'm not going to tell you my password, even though I'm all about live demos. And once I've authenticated, uh, it's going to ask me which organization. Now, you'll notice that I have two organizations. This is the R&D group in which I sit. That's the group, uh, you know, that's the organization in which I sit. And this is my private organization. 
The one that I, Josh, pay for. Yes, yes, if you're wondering, Pivotal doesn't give me a free Pivotal Cloud Foundry account. Makes me sad. Anyway, that's okay, it's still worth it, I pay for it. So I have, a, I have my own account that I pay for in a separate org. Uh, so I'm doing a demo, and uh, I may forget to turn it off, so I'm gonna put it in the platform engineering organization and let them pay for it, okay? So just like with GitHub, you can be part of multiple organizations, same here for, with Cloud Foundry. You can target different orgs in the same account, same installation, and you can have different installations. That done, I can interrogate my installed apps. I can say CF apps, and I can see that I've, I've got two applications right now. And what I wanna do is I wanna push this application that I just created up to the cloud. So I'll say SG reservations. Uh, that's probably already been done, just in case. Well, we'll try. So I'm gonna take that jar, I'm gonna push it into the cloud uh, environment, and it's gonna say, it's gonna take that incoming jar, and it's gonna try and detect what kind of artifact it is, what kind of application it is. It's going to detect this using something called a build pack. A build pack is a set of well-known scripts. It's a directory full of scripts that are in well-known places that do certain things in different uh, you know, phases of the uh, initialization. It lays down the file system that is needed to be able to run this application. In the case of Java and the Java build pack, it's gonna lay down a Java virtual machine and it's gonna set the RAM and so on so that you can run the application. It's gonna do all this for you uh, so that you don't have to worry about that stuff. You can override the default build pack, right? I'm we're using, there's a set of well-known default build packs that pr are provided by Cloud Foundry, but as it is just a Git repository containing scripts, you can provide any build pack you want. You can fork our open source build packs and tweak it if you want as well. Doesn't matter. And you can specify that I wanna always use this version of the build pack. So now, if you have the version of your source code and the version of the build pack, as long as those two are locked up, you can guarantee the same runtime environment five years from now, right? Or 10 years or whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is you can, you can get a reproducible build without having to do the, the heavy lifting of provisioning configuration. So once that's done, once it's created that file system, it's gonna turn that into a container and then deploy that container across the cluster. Right now I've only got one instance and we may indeed wanna scale it up and, and we can. So the application's now started. I've got the, uh, the command line that's been run to, to, to confirm it's working and there's the URL, so sgreservations.cfapps.io. Our application is live. Okay, I'm in production. There's that. Now, I've only got one instance, and that's not going to be great if I have a, a you know, denial of service or something like that. I can see that I've got one instance by going here to instance index. So VCAP application instance index. And I can see CF scale SG reservations. I can see that when I do that, there's one instance with one gig and one gig of uh, space. I'm gonna scale that up. I'm gonna say CF scale minus I two SG reservations. And we'll up the instance count. Oops, or, I'll, or it'll fail because I didn't put a space. So now I've scaled the application up. <clears throat> I've scaled the application up uh, and it's behind a load balancer. So now if I refresh this, giving you know, assuming I have a 20 seconds or whatever it was uh, to get the application started. We'll see it slowly start to, to load bounce from the first application, the first container, to the second one. Come on. There we go. One, <laughs> zero, one, et cetera. See, I'm hoping you can all see that. Okay, so now we have an application. It's in production. It's production worthy. We have addressed observability. We've looked at how to expose information about the application and make short work of, uh, of getting past the configuration so that we can deliver our application. This is a quick look at both Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. I hope uh, you saw something that you liked in all this. Um, this is old stuff. Everything we've just talked about you know, is at least uh, 2013. Some of it much older, right? So this is not even the reason we're here. Like I'm, I'm happy to talk about this, but this is like review. What I really want to talk about is what we're going to talk about in the next section, which is Spring Cloud. Spring Cloud is the thing that allows us to build a distributed system and to do so effectively so that we can actually get the value out of this approach. Now, I hope you enjoyed some of what we talked about here. I'm, uh, uh, I should stress that this is very, very ubiquitous. Spring Boot, for example, is used by, uh, there's 4.5 million unique downloads every month. For comparison, the entire Node.js community, NPM, every month, the entire thing, 10 million. So the fact that one technology inside of the JVM community has almost as much as all of Node.js, including all of the front-end developers all around the world, it's not bad. 
It's not bad at all. We're doing good. Um, Spring Boot itself is far and away the number one most widely used technology for building microservices. There's a great developer uh, uh, productivity report by Zero Turnaround that was just published that showed that both Spring Boot and Spring MVC are both like 30 or 40 percent or whatever of the, uh, the 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 usage for microservices and the distant and the number two the distant number two wasn't even close right um, or distant number three actually so it's Spring Boot or Spring MVC Spring Boot and then distant number three uh, I think that'll do it for now I, now's a good time for lunch I'm happy to answer questions uh, if you have them and uh, otherwise I'll look forward to seeing you at the after the break where we can actually cover the interesting stuff. Um, thank you so much. See you guys soon. We have, how long is the break, by the way? Do we know? Does anybody know how long the break is supposed to be? Okay, everybody, we're back. So, uh, before we left for, uh, before we left for the break, we had built a single service, a single application that was running on a single, uh, host and port and, and uh, we took care of operational concerns, things like observability. We, we looked at how Spring Boot's approach to convention over configuration uh, and ease of configuration makes it easy to override the default behavior if you need to in a pinch. This, uh, this mechanism uh, I demonstrated to you in terms of the application.properties property file inside of the source main resources directory, but uh, one, one thing I want to underscore is that you can provide configuration in other ways. For example, you could have an application.properties, uh, or rather an application.yaml, a, you know, a .yml file uh, as well, and that'll work as well. That's a hierarchical way of representing uh, properties, you know, uh, dot, dotted tree syntax, right? Uh, that's certainly one approach, but that's not going to be very useful if we have to change the application, or we have to promote the application from one environment to another. If we're taking the application from development to, to Q&A to staging, etc., I don't want to have to recompile my code to affect changes. I want to see those changes, those property configurations, uh, without having to recompile the build. And uh, as we have it right now, I have no way to do that. So we can look to a, a design pattern called 12-factor called, uh, style configuration. The 12-factor style configuration originates from the 12-factor manifesto. The 12-factor manifesto was written by Heroku in 2008. It's a, a set of good, clean cloud hygiene, things that you need to do to build applications that do the right thing in the cloud. They live and breathe natively in the cloud. Uh, the 12 factor manifesto des describes 12 principles, one of which is that configuration that is unique to an env environment should be kept external from the application in the environment for that application. And we can see that in action here. So I've got a, a, uh, a jar, right? Suppose I want to change the port, right? I can change almost anything in Spring Boot. I can change almost anything, even things that you wouldn't otherwise expect to be, to be something you could change uh, in the code for the application itself, I can change things like the port, the SSL, I can cha change the, the gzip connectors, I can do all that inside of Spring Boot itself because Spring Boot is running my embedded web server, not the other way around. Spring is the container and it's running Tomcat or embedded Jetty or embedded Undertow, which is the uh, servlet container that powers uh, Wildfly. It's running all of those as a library, as, a, as, a, as an API with which it's interacting to respond to HTTP requests on a certain port. So you can actually do some pretty amazing things that way. You can actually imagine doing aspect-oriented programming on Tomcat, right? Because Tomcat isn't running your application. Your application is running Tomcat. So the, the inversion uh, leads to some very, very powerful options, including, for example, changing the port. I could do that here, but I want to do it when I run the application because that's something that's going to change from one environment to another or even from one desk to another. So here I can say java minus d server.port equals 8020 minus jar, right? So now, now, by overriding the default configuration, by overriding the default value, I, uh, I get the result that I want without having to recompile the build. There it is right there, 8020. I can also use environment variables. I can say, I can say, export server underscore port equals 8030, java minus jar reservation service dot jar. And uh, here, I can see 8030. Right? So my application is now uh, on a different port, and I've con my, my configuration has converged. It's been fuzzily transformed into server.port. It's been lowercased. The underscore in between the, uh, the tokens and the environment variable has been um, canonicalized. And then 
we can see the result there that that works. So this gives us some flexibility. I can now move my application from one environment to another without having to do too much work. But this falls for falls short of four critical or key areas. The first is, what if I have configuration? If I have more than one service, or more than one instance of one service, I would still have to tediously duplicate and copy and paste my configuration from one instance to another. That would be uh, error prone and and slow. Another another f use case that this doesn't quite address is how do I how do I handle auditing and journaling? How do I st see who changed the configuration and if necessary to roll that configuration back? For that, I don't quite have an answer here. What about um, what about sensitive information, passwords, credentials, locators, things like that that shouldn't be stored in, under any circumstances in plain text on the file system at rest. How do, I, how do I address that use case? And then finally, how do I change the configuration whilst the service is running, whilst the process is up without having to restart it? Well, what I've shown you is a good start. It's, it's not nearly enough for those use cases. And I'm sure you can imagine a few ways by which we might address some of those challenges, some of those questions. We could, for example, have a directory full of configuration, a directory uh, with, with configuration property files. We can share the directory. That might solve the centrality issue. You could have everything in one place. I could even make that directory based on Git or Subversion. And uh, then, uh, by virtue of the fact that it's using those technologies, um, I, would, I would have auditing and journaling. I'd have a log of who changed what and when, and I'd be able to see it. But that doesn't address the security concern, right? And it doesn't address the fact that we need to have a way of configuring or reconfiguring our Spring applications, our clients, our configuration applications, or uh, the, the things that use that configuration without restarting. So for all of this, we need a little bit, something a little bit more sophisticated. For, some, for this, we need something a, a, a bit more powerful. And uh, so we're going to use the Spring Cloud Config Server. The config server is just that. It's a configuration service that manages different configurations. So we're going to say config server, config server, and I'm going to hit generate. And this config server is going to babysit a directory full of configuration, uh, a directory full of configuration that we're going to store on GitHub or Git, right? I've got a Git repository here that you can clone if you want for your own reference and edification later on under Josh Long, Bootiful Microservices Config with dashes in between the words. I'm going to clone this into my local machine. So there it is. Git clone that to the desktop config directory. Wi-Fi permitting, of course. OK. And uh, in my code here, <coughs> I'm going to configure the application. I'm going to say server.port. This is the config server that we've just stood up. We're going to configure it to run on port 8888. And we're going to tell it where to find the directory full of configuration. We're going to say Spring Cloud Config Server .git .uri equals, and we're going to point it to the home directory, forward slash conf, uh, desktop forward slash config. And then we're going to turn on the uh, the config server. We're going to activate the config server, like this. And now, this is going to act as an intermediary. It's going to act as a, a broker for our configuration. Clients are going to connect to the config service to draw their configuration, but the configuration will be managed by that directory or by the config server, which will then talk to the directory. So now we've solved the centrality and we've solved the auditing and journaling requirement. And because we've interposed this extra server, this little bit of indirection between the configuration clients, which rely upon that configuration, and the downstream services that or the downstream directory that provides a configuration, we now have an enviable place to uh, address things like security. Right? I can require authentication to talk to the service to get the configuration. And I can have the config server, for example, symmetrically decrypt encrypted properties in the property system, in the property files on the property in the file system. So if I have a, an encrypted value in the property file, I can tell the config server, here's the cipher, here's the key. When the client and the server authenticate, I want you to decrypt that value, but only in the client, right? Not in transit. So this will start up in port 8888. And if I have a microservice that connects to the config server on port 8888 that go goes by the name reservation hyphen service, it will see the configuration here. And uh, this configuration, uh, this configuration shows that we have two property sources. A property source is the properties that uh, our Spring client will, will see, it'll be able to use, to be able to configure itself. We'll see 
a properties, we'll see a set of properties from the reservation hyphen service dot properties. These are uh, keys and values from that property file that we can use to to um, to configure that one service. And we have a separate separate second separate or second set of properties called application app properties. These are properties that all microservices, no matter what their name, will see. Think of this as a fallback set of properties. So all microservices will see these values, but only the microservice identifying itself as the reservation hyphen service will see these values. These values get squashed together, or ma ma you know, merged together to form one basic set of keys and values. And if there is a conflict, as there is between server.port and server.port, then the more specific property file, reservation-service.properties, overrides the default fall-through property file. So you get a cascade, sort of. You get global properties and you get service-specific properties. So we've got two properties here. We've got server.port, which says, I want to I be equal to the value of the environment variable called port, or the literal called 8000, the, the, the string literal. And we've got a message called that says, hello world. So let's go ahead and connect our reservation service to this newly stood up config service. We're going to act as a client to the config service and have our reservation service talk to that config service to draw its configuration. The first thing we're going to need is the client, the config service client. And we'll get that in by bringing in Spring Boot, I'm oh sorry, Spring Cloud Starter Config. Spring Cloud Starter Config needs two things to do its work. It needs to know the name of the application, which in this case is the reservation hyphen service naturally. And it needs to know where to find the config server. So we say spring.cloud.config.uri equals HTTP localhost 8888. Now, this information isn't necessarily, I think, uh, and understandably, used earlier on in the initialization of the application. Think about it. The application starts up and then looks for the config service, where it then finds a set of property sources, keys and values, and then it uh, then applies those keys and values to the application. It does that at the same time as it would the properties in application app properties. So necessarily, these two properties have to be read and, and loaded before the rest of the configuration in the bootstrap of the application because you know, we, we, we cannot resolve the server at the same time as we're applying the configuration from the server. So by convention, Spring Cloud expects this information to be in a property file called bootstrap to properties. And indeed, for most microservices, these are the only two things you're going to specify. Everything else will live in the config service, right? So now I've got just these two keys and values, and these are the only things I need to really specify per app. And in fact, this, as I say, could have been an environment variable. You could have said export spring underscore cloud underscore config underscore URI equals, right? And that could also be mapped to DNS. It could be a load balanced uh, DNS app application on, uh, on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and in fact, that's the default. <laughs> so I just show you, I just did that so you would see what, what's happening. But point is, most of the time, you know, uh, you'll either specify it some other way. Okay. Okay. So now, that having done that, we should see the application spin up on port 8000 if we started it right now. I want to take advantage of that message, that hello world message. So I'm going to create a, a rest controller here called message rest controller or controller. Okay. And I'm going to inject the uh, the value. I'll say private st final string value private constructor and uh, in the constructor I'm going to say at auto wired and I'll say at value dollar sign dollar sign or sorry dollar sign curly bracket curly bracket message so here I'm using spring to inject that value from the config service just like I would any value from the uh, the property files or from any other part of the spring environment and all I'm going to do is I'm going to return when asked I'm going to return the values for consumption. I'm going to parrot the value out. Now, I may want to change this value later on in the future, so I don't want to restart. And in order to support that, I'm going to make this bean refresh scoped. So I'll restart the bean like so. Okay. Localhost 8000 reservations. There we go. Seems that's working, right? We've got the config server uh, correctly configuring their application's uh, port. What about the message? And that seems to have worked as well. Good. So we're making progress. Now, this message, however useful, isn't exactly correct, is it? We can go to the config directory here, desktop config, and we can see we've got a property here, Adam, reservation service dot properties. Say hello world. And instead of hello world, let's uh, 
let's be a little bit more specific. Let's say, hello, Singapore, okay? Extra exclamation marks. So as to reinforce my authenticity credentials and authority on Reddit. And uh, then we'll say git commit minus a minus m YOLO, okay? Now, having done that, I can visit the config server, uh, which I seems to have closed. I can visit the config server and I can see that the value is immediately visible and reflected in the config server. But our downstream microservice has no idea what's just happened. It doesn't know that there's a new value. This is by design. The last thing we want is for the client to constantly re-poll the, uh, the downstream config service for updated configuration. Instead, we need to tell the, the config client to redraw or refresh its configuration by reconnecting to the config server and recreating that one bean in situ. Now, we've seen that I've already annotated that bean to be refresh scope, so that gives us the mechanism we need to do that. We can trigger the refresh action one of two ways. We can connect all of our microservices to an event bus powered by something called Spring Cloud Stream, which we'll look at in just a bit. And all so connected microservices would automatically refresh their configuration when a message arrives telling them to. The second option is we could, for each individual node, explicitly trigger an actuator refresh endpoint. So curl minus d curly bracket curly bracket HTTP localhost 8000 forward slash refresh. Now this is an empty HTTP post. Okay, so let's line things up. What's going to happen is I'm going to hit enter and then hit command tab and then hit command r as soon as and as fast as my little fingers are going to let me what oh thank you go team see that's what i like some people some people just want to see me suffer on stage so they see the errors and they say nothing <laughs> it's not fair mob programming is awesome okay ready go okay so as soon as i hit enter I fat fingered it, I fixed it, course corrected, hit command tab again, went to the browser, hit command R, and there we go. I was able to w observe the updated value immediately. I didn't have to restart the process. That's because Spring has recreated this one REST controller. It discarded the internal representation of that REST controller and uh, recreated it anew. And we can then see that the injected value gets re refreshed automatically from the config service. This supports feature flags. I can now... Uh, change things while the service is running live without having to restart the service. This gives me the ability to decouple the release of software from the deployment of that software. I can have functionality that is latent or inert in the production software that isn't available, it's not active, right? Uh, this gives me the ability to do A-B testing. I can now lose uh, some functionality on a subset of the population and have them uh, use it in, in feedback and then I can use that feedback to decide whether to promote the functionality to the larger population or not. I've got a lot of potential here, a lot of really, really interesting things we can do with feature flags. Now, naturally, uh, there are other things we could talk about here, including the fact that uh, you should and could secure every end of the communication chain, right? I can make sure that the client does a mutual authentication, X509 certificate-based mutual authentication with the config server, or that the client does HTTP basic authentication uh, with the config server, uh, and I should... I, I, should, I would be remiss if I didn't also say that you should use SSL uh, to make sure that all communication from the config service and the config client are secure. But for now, it suffices to leave it as is and instead to, to move on. <sighs> Let's talk about how services discover each other in a distributed system. In a cloud environment, specifically a cloud environment, services come and go as they need to, as demand and capacity dictate. They're dynamic, they're ephemeral, they're fleeting. Things are going to change. The location of these different services are going to change. Uh, that's the nature of a dynamic cloud environment. But we cannot be too sensitive to those topology changes. Our, our code needs to be decoupled from that. My client should be able to discover another service without worrying about having to manually restart the service and teach it about a new IP. At first blush, this might seem like a use case for a DNS. But DNS, as it turns out, is actually a really poor fit for dynamic cloud environments for several reasons. Uh, there's a few obvious reasons, some of which are, you, you know, they can't be helped, but they're worth underscoring, worth restating. The first of which is that DNS requires resolution. It's not a lot of cost, but it is still latency, right? It's still something you have to pay. You can get rid of that resolution, that cost, that latency, by caching the, resol the resolution, the resolved, uh, rather, DNS, the, the IPs and ports. If you cache that, then you run the risk of having stale entries in your, in your, in your view of the world. If that service is no longer there and you and your client has cached that DNS entry, you're going to call a service that doesn't exist, right? Which is not a good idea in a dynamic cloud environment. 
So you either have to constantly incur the resolution cost or you have to uh, um, be prepared to have stale entries, which is true for almost anything, naturally. But just keep that in mind. That's a compromise. Another problem with DNS is that it requires a DNS server, naturally. But DNS servers are typically managed by other people, not the application developers. So it becomes another ticket. It becomes something that somebody else controls. Another problem with DNS isn't so much DNS as load balancers, and DNS load balancers as well, in specific. You see, load balancers are pretty dumb instruments. They don't really have the ability to, to answer interesting questions. Nor does DNS, for that matter. They don't have the ability to answer the question, is that service there? If I call that service, am I going get to a, get a response? We don't know if I'm going to get a response. So all I can do is make the call and then hope that there's something on the other side that will respond to me. If there's nothing there, then my client is going to block, which is a non-starter. That's unacceptable in a dynamic environment, in a cloud environment, in a high-performance system. If I'm stuck there waiting for a response, hopefully I've done the right thing. Hopefully I've specified at every level, at every place in my code, an aggressive client-side timeout. I've made sure that whenever a client calls another service, that there's a timeout that uh, stops it from hanging on, the, on, that, on that socket waiting for a response that will never come. Have you all done that? Everybody? And all of your code? Everywhere? Pop quiz, what's the default timeout for the Java net URL connection? Anybody? You don't know? Yeah, so then you haven't done it, right? That, that is probably used a thousand times and even the basic, in, in, even the basic uh, application in your program, right? If you don't know what that timeout looks like, you're in trouble. And by the way, it depends on which part of the java.net stack, but some of those parts are configured for perpetual timeout by default. That is to say, it never times out. It just blocks forever. And that kind of behavior, you know, that the underpinnings of the java.net uh, uh, package in the JDK from Java 1.0 more than 20 years ago, a lot of the behavior there makes perfect sense in the context of 20 years ago where services were very uh, static and they didn't change a lot and client applications were also fairly static as well. But those underpinnings, they disserve us now. One such example is that Java clients, by default, cache resolved DNS entries. Right? So if I have a, a if I have a uh, a Java client that calls a, a, a host and a you know a host, and I use DNS to cache that uh, to to resolve that IP. The JVM by default keeps that IP. So if I use if I'm using a load balancer, and the load balancer gives me back an IP, a DNS load balancer, and it gives me back an IP, the JVM is going to keep the resolved IP and then use that for all subsequent connections. It's going to defeat the load balancer. The whole point of the load balancer is to move the work across different nodes so as to to load balance but the JVM is going to pin it to a specific node, right? That's a useful behavior from 20 years ago, but it, it's a bit of a problem now in a cloud environment where these things will change. Load balancers in general uh, are, are pretty dumb instruments, as I say. They don't really know about the nature of your workloads. They don't understand that not all requests are created equal. As far as they're concerned, there's 10 requests coming to the door. They don't know that some of those requests are going to take two minutes and some will take two milliseconds. So they don't know how to evenly distribute based on the weight of the, uh, of the response, right? Not most of them. Your average load balancer also doesn't know about the nature of your business, about the kinds of routing decisions you need, you need to make for your business. Suppose you want to do something stateful. Maybe you have a service that has something stateful and you want to pin requests from a specific client, client to a specific node. Sure, some load balancers will have a, uh, you know, uh, they'll have built-in support for well-known types of stateful, right? They'll have support for J session IDs or cookies or whatever. Uh, but what about OAuth? Let's imagine you're Netflix and you're streaming video and that streaming video is on a certain node. I've got an OAuth client, an OAuth token coming in from an OAuth client and I want to pin the request from that client to that specific node. How do I do that? There's no, there's no checkbox for OAuth tokens or any arbitrary token, right? Or X509 certificates, right? How do we say that this identity corresponds to somebody who's doing something stateful on this process. What about more interesting kinds of load bouncing like data center aware load bouncing? How do I load bounce to nodes in, my sp in the same rack and then alternatively fall back to another data center if I need to? What about data sharding and locality? How do I say that this data lives on this certain node so the request to handle it should go to that node, for example? There's not an easy way to do this if you have a centralized load bouncer. So DNS and DNS load bouncers, or just load bouncers in general, have a, a fair amount of limitations. 
mostly due to the fact that we can't control it. It doesn't, it's not our application logic. And it's an extra piece of infrastructure that we have to manage that, dis, that doesn't serve us well in the cases where we need it the most. So we can get around this by using something called a service registry. A service registry, like a DNS server, is another piece of infrastructure. But as you'll see, it's much easier for the, the developers to have control over that, just in, in the same way that they would have control over, for example, the database. Right? They'd have control over what, how that gets deployed and managed. Uh, a service registry is like a phone book for the cloud. It gives us the same effect as DNS. It's a logical mapping from service ID to hosts and ports. And then we can use that to make decisions about how to route the request. Now, the, uh, the logic for the routing itself lives on the client now in this world, not in the load balancer. Because it lives on the client, you can do anything you want. You just interrogate the, you insert, interrogate the registry and use the results that come back to, to decide upon which node to send the request. Spring Cloud has a discovery client abstraction. The discovery client abstraction lets it easily talk to all manner of different uh, uh, service registries, including Apache Zookeeper, HashiCorp Console, etcd, although that one is not GA or, or production worthy yet. Cloud Foundry itself can act as a service registry because by definition, given a service ID, Cloud Foundry knows the hosts and ports on which that service is available. It put them there, right? Naturally. Uh, my favorite service registry is Netflix Eureka. Netflix Eureka has two big benefits. The first, of course, is that it's been used at scale by one of the largest websites on the planet for many, many, many years. How many of you, how many of you have Netflix? Okay. The rest of you don't have it yet. But I say yet because you will. <laughs> like, um, Netflix is a, a pretty popular. They stream something like 200% more video than YouTube every day. And I'm sure most of us thought that YouTube was the largest video portal on the, on the internet, right? 200%, 2x YouTube. That's insane. So we know that it works. It's been used by them for many years at scale. So uh, I'm gonna, that's the first benefit. The second benefit, the second reason I love Netflix Eureka is because it's really, 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 really easy to set up. And I am, I am nothing, nothing if not lazy. So I'm gonna go to start.spring.io and I'm gonna configure myself a Eureka service. Eureka server config client generate. Okay, open this up. I'll take some tea. Oh, that's good. Okay, spring.cloud.config.uri equals HTTP localhost 8888. I'm going to say spring.application name equals Eureka hyphen service. And then we're going to do the following. We're going to say at enable Eureka server. Now, I've got to rename this property file. It's tricky. You have to remember to rename that, rename that property file. The worst part is it would still work if you don't because the default is this URL, this value. Anyway, uh, I've got my Eureka server. I've said abracadabra, you're a Eureka. And I'm going to start it up. And we should see it spin up on port 8761. Now, uh, what we need to do now is to make it so that other microservices, our reservation service principally, will raise its hand. We're going to have the microservice raise its hand and say, listen, if anybody needs me, I'm here. This is my host. This is my port. Find me here. So right now, it doesn't do it, right? So here's our registry. A few things worth pointing out about our registry. First of all, very well done animated GIF. Okay. And then also, no applications registered yet. Nothing here. This is the one drawback to using service registration in discovery. It is invasive. Your code has to be made aware of it for it to work. Whereas the, the handling for DNS is typically handled either by the JV, JVM fundamental libraries or uh, by the platform itself. Now granted, if they worked, then we wouldn't, have, wouldn't be having this discussion in the first place. So it's not necessarily bad that we're doing something that was otherwise being done by the, the platform. But it's still something that you have to care about, right? Thankfully with Spring Cloud, uh, because of the abstraction, it is a minimal uh, you know, intrusion or middle bit, minimal, minimal uh, invasion. So I'm going to say Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. That's going to bring in the Discovery Client Abstraction Implementation for Netflix Eureka. And I'll say at Enable Discovery Client. And then having done that hard work, I'm going to go ahead and restart the service. Ah, oh, iced tea. You know what I think would be a good business in this beautiful country. More uh, vending machines with tea. Iced tea. Or just ice. 
<laughs> okay. Good. So having restarted, we can see that the service is now registered in the registry. There it is, reservation hyphen service. And we can, sure that it's, we can see that it's available on this IP, this service ID, and this port. It's now available for discovery. I've only got one instance of the service, but I may as well have 10 or 100, 1,000, in which case it would say up parentheses 1,000, right, instead of one. Good. So now we're ready to create a client, something that we can use to talk to our service and to, to interoperate, with it, interoperate with it by way of the registry. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to create our first client, the reservation client. And to build the reservation client, I'm going to use Spring's web support. I'll use the config client. I'll use Eureka for service registration and discovery. I'll use RabbitMQ for, zip, uh, for stream processing and Zipkin for distributed tracing. I'll use Histrix for circuit breaker, Zool for microproxy, and the REST repository support. And because we have the time, we're going to use OAuth for security. Because YOLO, okay? Now, that'll do for now. That'll be okay. We're going to go ahead and hit generate. And uh, we're going to open up the, uh, the client. Now, this, uh, we'd have to do the normal pro forma kind of stuff. First of all, we have to say uh, at enable discovery client. And we have to open up the property file. And we say spring.cloud.config.uri equals HTTP localhost8888 spring.application.name equals reservation hyphen client. And uh, then we rename the property file to be bootstrap.properties, as we've done time, countless times before. So bootstrap.properties. Now, the question is, what do we want to do here? This is no mere service. This is no regular service. What we're trying to do is to, to call the downstream data and then return it back to a client. This is called an edge service. And when I say client, I'm referring to iPhones, Androids, HTML5 experiences, Rokus, Playstations, Xboxes, your smart TVs. In the Internet of Things, darn near everything has an IP address these days. Everything. Your streets here in beautiful Singapore have sensors. Where do you think that sensor data goes? It goes back to a computer. It has an IP address. Your streets have IPs, right? There are human beings walking around on this planet with organs that have IPs on them. Seriously. So you cannot afford to ignore the myriad possibilities for different clients. Even the most conservative and boring of organizations today has to support, at the very least, Android, iOS, and HTML experiences, right, for your, for your services, for the, for the experiences by, used by your customers. You have to. And these things are all going to talk, hopefully, to some of the same set of services. So you can't afford to make them siloed, to have duplicated investment there. So instead of... Uh, instead of connecting each one of these different clients to each one of our microservices, insert, we're going to insert an intermediary, an intermediary called an edge service. And the reason we're going to do this is because the clients have often different payload protocol and security restrictions. Sometimes the, the data that they need is different as well. So the, the, path, the pattern here is to build an edge service that is specific to the client. We're going to say this is the HTML5 edge service. This is the iOS edge service. This is the Android edge service, etc. Right? We can handle client-specific concerns in that edge service. So let's, let's talk about HTML5. HTML5 browsers today are really, really, really powerful. How many of you have ever seen JS Linux? This is my favorite example of the possibility of the web. So what I just did was I went to betal.org forward slash JS Linux, as in JavaScript Linux, and uh, it is a x86 machine code emulation or emulator written entirely in JavaScript. When I loaded that page, it downloaded a Linux kernel ISO. And then it booted the ISO entirely in JavaScript. There's no server-side state at all. To demonstrate, lsla vi hello.c. Let me open this up. I'm going to hit escape i. And I'm going to say, Hello, Singapore. Okay, extra exclamation marks. And remember, I'm, I'm using my browser to command up and down because it's just a DIV element. The TTYS device is a DOM element in my browser. Okay, so now I'm going to say escape WQ. I'm going to say TCC minus O, hello, hello.c. That's the tiny C compiler. I'm gonna, there we go. So I, co I compiled C code in a Linux distribution running inside of a DIV element 
in the browser. I booted Linux in an HTML browser, an HTTP browser. So when people say that you need to build a native desktop application and you need to use Windows Forms or DTK, tell them that the browser boots Linux now and that's no longer necessary, right? <laughs> the point is you can do really, really amazing things on the browser. HTML5 experiences today are insanely powerful. You can do 3D rendering, you can do all sorts of cool stuff, right? That said, browsers, HTTP browsers, live in a secure sandbox, necessarily. They cannot make requests to different host and ports outside that sandbox. You can get around that by adding a policy to every single microservice, a policy that exempts cross-origin requests, right? That would be one idea, but that would require retrofitting every single microservice just to accommodate one new client. If you had to do this at scale, if you had more than a handful of services, you'd be spending a lot of time having other teams redeploy their services just to accommodate your client. That would defeat the autonomy that you're trying to obtain by moving to this approach in the first place. So an alternative and much more scalable approach is to instead just proxy the data back and forth from the outside clients to the downstream array of services hidden behind this uh, edge service. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to use something called a microproxy. Now, we have on our class path here in the reservation client, the Netflix Zool microproxy. That's this bit right here. Now I'm going to go ahead and comment out a few things that I don't, I don't need just yet. And we're going to see that we've got Spring Cloud Starter Zool there on the class path. Zool is a reverse proxy and you can set up arbitrary routes. You can say I want to, I want to have a route on my edge service that goes from localhost 9999 foo to go to google.com or google.sg if I want. In this case, however, it suffices to, to just uh, let Spring Cloud do its work because Spring Cloud is already aware of my service registry. It knows about the registered services because of the discovery client abstraction. And so as a result, it's been nice enough to set up convenient uh, routes for us on the edge service that map to the uh, service IDs in the registry. So reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations. There's my edge service, right? Edge service, actual service. Edge, actual, edge, actual, edge, actual, edge, actual, edge, actual. There's a couple questions you may have at this point. First of all, how does it know to which instance it should route the request? We've given a service ID and it has to pick. Right now there's only one instance in the registry, so naturally it's going to use that one. But suppose I had 10 or 1,000. How does it pick that instance? That routing decision is, uh, is, as I say, done on the client. It's done using something called Netflix Ribbon. Netflix Ribbon is a client-side load balancer. It is the enterprise distributed systems microservices equivalent of eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's just going to pick one based on some strategy that you provide. By default, that strategy is to do round-robin load balancing. Right? It's going to do round-robin load balancing for you. Uh, but it's an object, the strategy. The strategy is something that you can override. You can do weighted response-based load balancing. You can do data locality-based load, balanc load balancing. You can write your own strategy that does something with OAuth tokens. You can do whatever you want. Now you have the, right, you have the ability to write a load balancing strategy and then unit test it and then version control it. Control over how nodes get routed to is in your hands now. And you can plug it in centrally and have that work for all the services. And now you, you have one less thing to ma manage in the system. So that's the first thing that we need to understand. The second thing is that when this proxy makes the request to the downstream service, it passes in the origin URL as part of the headers. And so you can see that the downstream service has adopted its URLs. It's rewritten the URLs to say localhost 9999, when in point of fact, they're actually coming from localhost 8080. From the perspective of the client, everything looks like it should. Everything looks like it was generated on that port, on that service, on that instance. The client has no idea that that JSON originated in some other process, some other node, some other place, etc. And it doesn't need to know. Now, we have everything for, we need, for example, to build an interesting HTML5 based application. Our HTML5 application can talk to localhost 9999 and talk to the, to the, to the different services and they're off, ra off to the races. They've got everything they need to build an interesting experience. We should absolutely, absolutely use HTTPS. Remember, it's a requirement for HTTP2, so you're going to have to get there anyway. 
we should probably use uh, SS, uh, sorry, OAuth or HTTP Basic, some sort of authentication to protect this service. But suffice it to say, we've done more than we need to at this point, right? The HTML5 developers have access to all the backend services, and assuming you're use of, using ubiquitous HTTP and JSON, you may be done. Now, sometimes it's required that you send different types of data back, that you transform the data, that you sometimes synthesize data based on two different services. Maybe you've got service A and service B, and you want to compose the data and then send the results back to the client uh, for, for consumption there. In this case, we need to do something more than just blindly proxying the data back and forth. In this case, we need to do some sort of transformation or translation on the downstream services. This kind of edge service is slightly different than a microproxy. This kind of edge service is called an API gateway. And so we're going to do that. We'll go back to our build, or rather our application, and we're going to stand up another REST controller on the edge service called the Reservation API Gateway REST Controller. Okay? And we're going to map this to request mapping uh, forward slash reservations. We're going to make this a REST controller. And we're going to create an endpoint. In our case, we're just going to create a simple endpoint that just streams the names back to the client, right? It streams the name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to call the downstream service, I'm going to call the downstream JSON and strip away all the surrounding strata from the JSON. I'm going to keep only the names. So Josh and Nias and Aran and uh, Loon and Weiren and and so on, right? I'm going to just keep the names, nobody else, nothing else, right? Just those. So I'm going to say whenever somebody goes to get value equals names will uh will serve back a collection of strings. In order to do this, I'm going to use the Spring Framework REST template. The REST template is an object that we can use to make HTTP calls in a convenient way. It makes short work of, of common HTTP exchange patterns, git, put, post, delete, etc. Uh, the REST template, however, has no idea about our service registry, and it doesn't know about ribbon by default. We need to teach it to do so. So we're going to configure a bean of type REST template here. And we're going to configure an interceptor on that REST template that will pre-process any request and extract out from the request URI the host. It's going to treat the host as a service ID. It's going to pass that service ID to our registry, in this case, Ribbon, uh, sorry, uh, Eureka. It's going to get all the service instances back, the collection of service instances, and it's going to pass that collection to Ribbon, which is then going to pick from among them uh, and then use that and then we're going to use that final resolved host and port to make the request. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. This dot rest template dot exchange HTTP colon forward slash forward slash reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations and we're going to make an HTTP git call so git we're not going to send any data it's going to be a git not a not a not a not a put or post for example so we have no body in the request so we're going to send null and then for this final parameter we need to tell the rest template what kind of data we want back remember we're going to call a downstream service a rest api that has json i can tell the rest api to give us a, a string payload that would work certainly i could say uh, give us a collection of bytes although that's a little i don't i don't think that's particularly useful in this case what i want to say is uh, you know i want to i want the data back i want the json back and i could say give me a map of 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 the JSON, where each attribute in the JSON becomes a key in the map, or I could say, give me a Jackson JSON node. So Jackson is uh, the Java API for marshaling uh, JSON, right? And the JSON node object is like a document object model like structure that you can use to traverse the the JSON tree. I could do that, or I could ask it to give me a collection of resources whose payload is of type reservation. Recall that in Spring Hot OS. Spring Hot OS uh, resources, each one of them has a payload and a collection of links. So I want to take the JSON and turn it back into an envelope object. I want to turn it back into a resource with a, whose payload is a type reservation, who in turn has a collection of links. So there's a few reasons this doesn't work. The first and most obvious is that we don't have the type reservation on the class path, right? I can add that here. I'm going to add a, a representation of that type on my client. I'll say reservation name, and I'll create a getter, and there we go. Uh, and it still doesn't work, right? The un to understand this, we need to understand that uh, Java has trouble with instance variables and generic parameters. If I 
look at this list of x, new list of array list. What is that generic parameter? What is t here? Sure, at compile time. Now, what about at runtime? Yep, it's it's basically the same as it's almost the same as object. It it actually there's some there's some nuance, but it's as far as Java is concerned, what you wrote was list x equals new array list. There's no parameter there at all. It's untyped. At runtime, Java doesn't see the instance type. That's because of a compromise that the Java language designer ha designers had to make in 2005, more than 10 years ago, when they grafted on uh, generic parameters onto the Java language. This is a process called type erasure. It means that at, at runtime, using reflection, you have no ability to capture that generic information. You can cheat a little bit. You can say class x extends array list of string, and uh, then you can say list of string x equals new x, and at runtime, t will actually equal string, as you expect. And if you understand what we're doing here, that we're creating a subclass, then you know that we can also use an anonymous subclass, right? Which is a Java 1.1 feature. So here, I'm just going to create a su subclass in situ. I'm overriding the, de the definition of that object in the same place as I'm instantiating it, right? Not a big deal. But it works. Now I, now I have list of string t. If you understand this, then you know what we need to do. We need to use subtyping to capture generic parameters. This is called the type token hack. Uh, sorry, design pattern. It's called the type token design pattern. And uh, the way it works is fairly similar. You'll see different implementations of, of, of you know all across the Spring and Java ecosystem. There's you know all, all across the Java ecosystem. You'll see different implement implementations. Spring has one because it's not a, a novel idea. For example, it's just something you have to do. So we're going to say. Parameterized type reference equals new parameterized type reference, and the parameterized type reference, uh, the parameterized type reference, gives us back a Java lang reflect type. So get Java lang reflect type, and if I go to the type, I can see that it says that that is a parent of Java lang class, right? So the Java lang class is what I want ultimately. So I can use that now. I can pass that last object there into the REST template. And the REST template understands that, OK, you want me to take the JSON and turn it into whatever type is, em is embodied by that parameterized type reference. And then we can use that response entity. We can say, OK, I've got the body. Do I, you know, I've got the status code. Do I want that? No. Do I want the value? No. Do I want the headers for the HTTP request? No. What I really want is the body. The body has the collection of resources whose content is a collection of reservations. And I'm going to stream over each one of those reservations and I'm going to transform them or map them using a lambda. I'm going to say for each lambda, for each reservation, reservation, I want to keep, I want to return only the reservation name. And then I'm going to store all the reservations in a list. So collectors.to list, etc. And I can replace that as so. Okay? So now I've got a three liner. I'm calling the downstream service. I'm doing some basic transformation. We should be able to restart it. I'll take some tea. It'll be great. Hoo ah. That's not tea. It's lemonade. Okay, localhost. 9999 reservation name. So there we go. My edge service is calling the registry, it's getting the service ID, it's calling the downstream service, I'm getting the data back, I'm transforming it from a collection of reservations to a collection of string names, all in the blink of an eye. I'm, I'm ignoring, for the moment, for the instance, uh, I'm ignoring for the, for the instant uh, the fact that right now I've only got, what, eight records? Twelve records? I don't know. Not, not many, right? I'm ignoring that there's very little, there's very little data here. I'm also ignoring that I'm just calling one service. If I were to call more than one service, then I would want to do this concurrently. I'd want to call two different services at the same time and then join the results back up. If I were calling a service with more than, say, you know, a thousand records, I'd probably want to stream that data back. Right? I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to do a select all, so to speak. And so, for both streaming use cases and for easy uh, declarative kind of concurrency. I, invest, I recommend that you take a look at and investigate the realm of reactive programming, for which Pivotal's reactor project is an ideal candidate. Uh, there's a lot to be said on that, and I'm sure we could in a whole, a whole other talk on that. But for now, we've only got one service. It's got a very small amount of data. It's fine. Okay. Now, 
we're making we're taking some liberties here. We're making some assumptions. We're saying we don't care. Um, you know, we don't. We're, we're happy to set, content ourselves with the fact that this is going to load balance across the available instances of the service, if there are available instances of the service. If there are one or more registered instances of that service, this is going to work just fine. But what happens if there are zero instances of that service? What's going to happen? And here we uh, here we run into a, a, a bit of a roadblock, right? We run into a bit of a problem. You see. If there are zero instances of that service registered, it's going to throw an exception. It's going to try and divide by zero, basically, and it's going to throw an exception, and we're going to have a big fat Java stack trace in our iPhone clients, which isn't good. Can we, what? Are you going to turn the air on? What? Yeah, it's really, are you guys warm? Me too. Not, not as cold as before, but not as hot as right now. Just right. The Goldilocks principle. Okay, so we, we're confronted with a, a problem. If, if we try and load balance across zero instances, we're going to get a big, big fat Java stack trace, and that's unacceptable. We have to understand that in a sufficiently distributed system, failure is a statistical inevitability. It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We need to optimize for time to remediation. You see, we cannot build a system on the predicate, on the lie that services will always be available. As you mo add more capacity and more instances, that uh, that uptime will diminish. For a few nodes, it's already pretty significant. You're not going to have nine nines, that's for sure. Or five nines, even. For tens of nodes or hundreds of nodes, this can be very quickly uh, hours per month of downtime. Hi. Sorry. Did we already do? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is. I thought we did. Okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> No, I was just sending a parking note to the tree because we can decorate for lunch at 1 o'clock. Ish. Okay. So we need to understand that uh, failure will happen. It's a guarantee, right? Failure in a su sufficiently distributed system is a guarantee. It's going to happen eventually. And we need to understand that we need to address that in our code. High performing websites and organizations understand this fact intrinsically, natively. They live and breathe this reality. There are people at Google that wake up every day and they put on their Google socks and their Google underwear and their Google, Google t-shirts and they jump, jump on the uh, Google bus heading to the Google campuses whilst talking to their Google colleagues and checking their Google mail and their Google phones. And when they get to the Google campuses, they no doubt proceed directly to the Google cafeteria where they have their Google gourmet breakfast. <laughs> and whilst chugging voluminous amounts of Google Gourmet Kool-Aid, they may accidentally have a Google accident and spill some of the Google Kool-Aid on their Google shirts. <laughs> this necessitates a trip to the Google laundromat, where they will do their Google laundry at the Google laundromat while strolling about in a, a Google gold sequined Google bathrobe. When they're done with that, they may decide that they want to get back on that horse. There are no quitters, after all, so they go back to the Google Gourmet cafeteria and have more Google breakfast. And then having done that, they may then decide to get on with the business of the day. It is, after all, getting on past 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and for some of them, they may get on a Google bicycle or a Google shuttle or a Google bus and go to the Google data centers, where they will walk the Google data center aisles and find completely and utterly unsurprisingly to them that some of their Google servers have Google died. <laughs> it's not surprising to them because they've got more than 2 million enterprise-grade Google servers deployed in Google data centers all around the Google world. <laughs> and they don't care. They don't care that some of their Google servers, Google died, because they didn't build their systems to be sensitive to the loss of a few nodes. That's why they're Google. And we need to do the same thing. We need to build our systems in the same style. We need to understand that failure will happen. They didn't care even when they got the alert at 8 in the morning telling them that those services had died. They had far more pressing matters, like the Google Kool-Aid on their Google t-shirt. <laughs> their systems aren't in fire. Nothing's wrong. Everything's going to be fine. They built their systems to be robust and resilient to that failure. Netflix also understands this, this fact. Netflix has a suite of software components called the Simeon Army. The Simeon Army are basically little agents of, agents of chaos. 
little terrorists that run around in production causing all sorts of havoc and craziness. They purposefully kill minus nine processes. They RM, RF, database and disk partitions. They, they block ports. They even have one called Chaos Kong, which purposefully kills a whole data center availability zone in production. They do this to themselves during office hours when people are on hand and available to respond to, cha to, respond to the crisis so that they can be sure that if there's an actual crisis when people are four in the morning, people when at four in the morning when people are asleep, then everything's gonna work as expected. They'd much rather find out during two in the at two in the afternoon when people are at the, at, the, at the office on hand to respond than at four in the morning when people are asleep. Netflix knows that ev eventually failure is going to happen. These organizations and many others besides say, you build it, you run it. This is a very adult mindset. They say, you're an adult, you can use whatever technology you want to solve the problem at hand, but be prepared to get the phone call at four in the morning when something goes wrong. There's no separate operations team that's gonna, uh, the, uh, that's gonna to handle it for you. You wear the pager, right? You build it, you run it. This, by the way, I think speaks volumes as to why organizations, organizations like Netflix uh, use Spring Boot and Spring Cloud to build production-worthy services at extraordinary scale because they want to get production-worthy services up and running first and fast. You see, we live in a different era now. There's no longer this artificial divide between developers and operations. There's no longer, it is no longer the case that developers are the only ones charged with delivering business uh, di differentiating functionality. And it is no longer the case that operations are the only ones who are charged with ensuring the stable uh, evolution and management of the software in production. Operations job isn't to say no, 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 and to stop change. And it's not developer's job to, to write code that doesn't run sa safely, right? Developers have to write production-worthy code. They have to care for it. And there's no better way to make developers care about production-worthy code than by making them wear the pager. They'll care a lot more when they're worried about being woken up at four in the morning. These organizations understand that. This is, what, this is the very spirit of DevOps. DevOps is an ancient Malaysian word, a very old Malaysian word. It means empathy. Empathy between operations and developers. Empathy for the situation in which we both find ourselves. It means that these two are on the same page. They're both charged with delivering new functionality for the business as fast as possible. And they're both charged with delivering stable production systems. This is not either or. No longer are operations the sin eaters. It used to be that we would take our terrible code and throw it over the wall. And operations would take it. And if they ran it, then it's their problem. The fools. <laughs> right? That mindset makes no sense anymore. It's gone. It has to go. So we need to care now about making this service production worthy. We need to care about resilience. A big part of that is systemic observability, and a big part of that is uh, some of the patterns that we're going to look at when we, when we come back. Now we're, we're in a good place to break. Um, so there you go. I'm happy to answer questions on what we've just talked about so far. Uh, when we come back, we're going to look at, oh boy, we're going to look at resilience and reliability patterns, how to make the system ro robust in the case of service outages for both reads and writes. And we're going to look at how to make different systems agree upon distributed state. We're going to look at observability and how to get systemic uh, observability across the different nodes in a system. We're going to look at security and then we're going to look at data orchestration or messaging based microservices. It'll be quick. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys uh, and gals as soon as possible. I don't know when that is. I guess it's an hour from now. So, you know. Um, cheers. Do not step on that white cable. How was lunch? Good. Lunch is a surreal experience here. So, all right, welcome back. Uh, where we left off, when we left off, uh, before the, the, the break, uh, I had broached the idea that we have to build services that are gonna do the right thing in the face of service outages and topology failures. This is critical, and I, and I hope I underscored how important this is uh, 
as you move to this cloud native architecture. A cloud native system is, as I say, four things. It's one that lends itself to easy, agile iteration. It's one that uh, does the right thing in the face of elastic scale, benefits from the elasticity of a, of, of a cloud, for example. It's one that does the right thing in the face of service uh, outages or topology changes. And it is one that is observable. So let's talk about that third one, that third point, that third tenant. We introduced in the last example a REST API that uh, calls our downstream service. And uh, it does the right thing should we have one or more instances of that service registered in the registry. But if we have zero instances, then it's going to, it's going to blow chunks. We're going to see a big fat Java stack trace, and, and that's unacceptable. So we need to think about how to make this a little bit more resilient, how to optimize uh, you know, for the fact that failure will happen. High-performing organizations optimize for time to remediation. Instead of trying to build a system where everything is highly available, instead build a system where the time to fix that error, an error that will come, is as minimal as possible. If time to remediation, that is to say, how long it takes for you to get the system in a state that the client can continue using it, if time to remediation is zero seconds for any given node or service, then you are effectively 100% highly available. right? But while the re results may appear the same, do you have a, anything? OK, I'm screaming for now. It's fine. But when you can, please. Um, while the result from the perspective of the user may seem the same, it has profound implications on the way we need to build our systems. The result, the approach that we have to, to, to embrace to build our systems is very different. <coughs> <coughs> so what can we do here? I want to make sure that if somebody calls this endpoint and we try and load balance and it throws an exception, that we handle that gracefully. And I want to make sure that we give the downstream service, the service that we're calling that's sick, time to recover. After all, the last thing we want to do is deluge it if it's trying to come back online. So I'm going to introduce a circuit breaker. A circuit breaker, uh, very much like the component in a building, in a modern building, uh, is a component that when there's a risk of an overwhelming amount of electricity or traffic, uh, opens and it pre prevents successive uh, uh, calls from going through. This, in a building, stops the risk or prevents the risk of a, of a fire, which is good, which is what we want. I would much rather lose the electricity and lose the lights than to lose the whole building for a fire. Um, so how can we do that here? I'm going to go back to my build, and I'll use Spring Cloud Starter Hystrix. Hystrix is a circuit breaker from Netflix. Peoples. I'm not sure what's happening. People are stirring. Anyway. Uh, we, we're going to use a circuit breaker from uh, Netflix. We're going to enable that circuit breaker. Hi. Sorry, you no you problem. Seems I'll it's just dead. change back. Cheers. Thank you very much. Right. We're going to use a circuit breaker from Netflix. We're going to say at enable circuit breaker. Uh, and with that, we can now cordon off this particularly risky service to service call, the shaky service to service call, by using the Hystrix command annotation. So this is a, a third party. API called Javanica, which is itself just a, uh, uh, an annotation-based approach for consuming the Hystrix circuit breaker library. Uh, and one of the conveniences is that you can now deign that a, a method should be a fallback method. So here, I'm going to create another method with the same uh, prototype, if you will, the same signature. Thank you. Ah, right. uh, wonderful. Uh, yep, good. Let's see. Money. Can you all hear me now? Better? Yes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, that's so good. It's what I've always wanted. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to build a, a fallback method that just returns an empty array list. And this is not a particularly useful fallback, but uh, it does give us something instead of a big fat Java stack trace. High performing websites will do this sort of thing all the time. They'll say, oh, well, you, you went to the search engine service, uh, but it's not available. So here are some machine learned recommendations from across the web. Or even better, instead of showing you the option to do a search, you just get the recommendations, right? Parts of the page can appear and disappear based on the availability of that service. <clears throat> you can achieve this effect in part by using the discovery client and talking to the registry to see if the service is there, and then also in part by protecting against uh, pathways that have errors in them. Here, we've done that uh, for, for uh, our, our service here. Now, of course, we have 
information about both the service and the client. So we could use the registry to ask the question, is that service there? And then to not bother calling the service in the first place. But we may not always have the ability to interrogate some other system's uh, registry. We don't have the ability to ask third-party APIs questions about whether their services are online. So the circuit breaker is the, uh, the sort of band-aid. It's a reaction instead of the pre pre proaction, right? So here, I've got enough, a fallback method. Let's go ahead and see it in action. I'm going to go ahead and call the, the happy path, the 80% case. Uh, do I have my service running? Thousand. I'm not sure if I killed the service or not. If you change, uh, so when I when I went away for lunch, I my my network changed, so I've got a different IP. So things are nice and different. Okay. Local host. Eight thousand reservations. Good. There's that. Eureka, there's this, client, oh, could you hear that? Oh, I wish I could share that. I think there would be far less war if we could all just crack our knuckles. Anyway, let's see. There we go. So there's the happy path, right? Everything's working just fine. I'm making requests. It's going through the edge service to the downstream service. Now, let's kill the downstream service here. And as we do that, the service becomes no, no longer available. We call the service. It throws an exception after a timeout. And then finally, we get the, the fallback method. Now, the circuit breaker would be kind of interesting uh, if it were just a mere try-catch block. But it's more than that. You see, it's stateful. It's going to look at this, this pathway, and it's going to see that enough successive attempts to call that pathway, to traverse that pathway, have failed. And so it's going to, instead of deluging the downstream service, it's going to route directly to the fallback, sort of switching the train tracks. Right? So now let's see that in action here. As I make requests, you can see it stuttering. It's hesitating right there. It's trying to call the service, but it's timing out, and then we get the result. If I lay down on the uh, refresh button, and drive traffic, we'll see it eventually stop doing that. Eventually, it'll go directly to the fallback. Oh, so there you go. So we can see that here. Whee. It's just going as fast as I can refresh. Right? It's not timing out anymore. It's smart enough to see that enough attempts have failed and to then divert traffic. It's also smart enough to heal itself. Right? So if I restart the reservation service, it'll eventually percolate back to life. The, the service will re-register with the registry. The registry will, do, will propagate its, uh, its understanding of the world back to the clients. The clients will then re-allow uh, re traffic to go through. It'll attempt to allow traffic to go through again. So we build a self-healing system, so to speak. As long as parts of the system come back into place, they can self-describe, self-configure uh, themselves through the registry. <coughs> this is very, very useful. Right? We all know that uh, if, if, a, if a website isn't working, if a website's going very slow, the best thing that you can do is to refresh the browser a lot, right? Is that, is that true? Uh, of course not, right? Like, you're just going to overwhelm the service. It doesn't help anybody. So this defeats that effect. This protects the downstream service from the torrent of activity hammering it as it's trying to come back to life. It gives it time to warm up if you need as well. We're protecting our system. If you're using something like Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry will move heaven and earth. It'll, do, it'll work all day and all night to make sure that if you say, I want 10 instances of this service available at all times, that darn it, there are 10 instances of this service available at all times. It'll wear the proverbial pager. right? But it's our job as developers and architects to build our system in such a way that we're resilient to topology changes, as has happened in this case. Now, in this case, I'm just reading data from the downstream service. But what about a write? What about writing data? I've got an edge service. I've made a request. I'm posting. I'm putting something to the edge service, and that's going to be transmitted to the downstream service. What happens then? Well, how do you, what does that mean? Like, if I have a downstream service that uh, isn't there, how do I, you know, it's, I can't send a request to a service that's not there. Cash. Sorry? 
something like that, right? You want to buffer it. So what we're trying to do here in this case is to, to get two systems to agree upon state, one of which may not be available. So let's, let's modify our edge service here, our API gateway, and add another endpoint. This is our REST controller. This is the, there we go. We're going to add another endpoint that will take the data and then write it. So we'll say public void write. We're going to say request body. And I'm going to say that whenever somebody posts JSON to my edge service on port 9999, that the JSON should be converted from the JSON to this reservation entity. And then my job here is to somehow get the data uh, to the downstream uh, reservation service. Right? Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And I could use the REST template here as well. But for the reasons we've just described, that may fail catastrophically. This is an age-old problem, right? That getting one service separated by a network partition to work with another is a hard problem. But there are many different ways we can get around this, many different easy-to-use patterns, or uh, fairly easy-to-use anyway. The one way that I actively discourage and that I do not recommend is to use distributed transactions. Distributed transactions are provably the worst way to solve this problem. If your goal is to slow down the system, and not actually guarantee consistency, then there's still the possibility that they're the worst solution for that problem, although they usually are the best for that one particular goal. Don't use distributed transactions. Distributed transactions on the JVM are modeled by the JTA API. How many of you have ever used JTA? OK, so I give away hugs. I give away hugs for free for the people that have been using that. Uh, JTA is middleware. It's a client-side binding, if you will, for the XOpen protocol just like the servlet API is a client-side binding or middleware for the HTTP protocol. Right? The XOpen protocol is a very old protocol. It describes a single point of failure called the transaction manager, which is supposed to keep a transactional log of different transactional resources, XA resources. Right? Each resource is enlisted in a transaction. They all hold hands on the, whenever the transaction, transaction manager says go, and then they jump, they commit. And if something goes wrong, then the transaction manager has each one of them roll back. Now, this is a, a bad idea lots, for lots of reasons. First of which uh, is that it's a single point of failure. The, the second reason is that it's completely irrelevant in modern distributed computing. Most resources aren't XA resources. Your REST API doesn't implement XA at all. Right? So it's not a good solution. We need uh, other solutions, different solutions. And so we can use a, uh, a markedly better and newer idea, a more contemporary, a more modern approach that came from the 1980s. It's called the Saga pattern. The Saga pattern has two key constraints. You design your systems as a set of interleavable, that is to say, reorderable transactions. As long as they can be reordered, it doesn't matter which order you run the transactions in, that's the first constraint. The second constraint is that every transaction that you have has to have a semantic that is to say, not general purpose, but semantic, business logic specific, compensatory transaction. A transaction that rolls back the state to a semantic, uh, a, a well-known semantic state. Right? It rolls back the system to a well-known well -known semantic state. So a good example of this is uh, like kayak.com or orbits.com. These websites let you book, for example, a hotel, a car, and a flight. Well, when, when you go to that website, it tries to call the hotel website it tries to call the airline website, and it calls the car rental website. It uses web services to get all of these uh, uh, transactions booked. If any one of them should fail, it then cancels the booking. It cancels the hotel reservation. It cancels the flight. It's a semantic rollback. It undoes somehow via the API, via the, via the thing, what it had done. And the only other constraint there is that the, tra the compensatory transaction has to be retriable. It has to be idempotent. I should be able to retry the compensatory transaction as many times as I need to to get the result. If I, and I should be able to do so without any extra side effects. If I can build my system and comply with these two constraints, then I can guarantee consistency across a distributed system. Now, it's worth noting that the Saga pattern originated in the context of a single node, a single long-running process. But the, result, the, the constraints, the dilemma, the dimensions of the problem are very much the same. What is a network partition but time? It is a delay. They are the same thing in terms of how we have to solve the problem. If you're solving a long-running process and you want to have a transactional resource that uh, you, wanna, you can't hold open for a long time, it's the same 
dilemma as you have when you have a, a network partition. So you can, if you use a saga pattern, you can you can solve very very interesting sort of distributed uh, you know pro distributed consensus problems. In our case, in our for our purposes, however, that's a bit overkill. We don't even need to do the the saga pattern, as novel and innovative as it is for the for something that came out 30 years ago. Instead, we can use something even older from 40 or 50 years ago, called messaging. Right? We're going to use eventual consistency, and that's just a five dollar word for messaging. It's the idea that we're going to store and forward the write through a broker, a, a message queue. I have on my machine RabbitMQ. It's one of many choices. And I could use Spring Integration. Spring Integration is a framework for building event-driven or messaging-based systems. It solves a lot of the same use cases as you might otherwise solve with, with Axway Integrator or Tibco, Tibco or Web Methods or Mule or whatever. Uh, except instead of instead of having a centralized broker, instead of having a centralized message bus, it is designed as a framework. It's designed as a set of components that you can hang off the side of any Spring application. So the integration logic lives where you need it to be. Spring integration has at its heart, at the core of it, this concept of a message channel. A message channel is a Java util queue, basically. It's a pipe through which messages pass. Spring framework has message objects. These are envelope objects that have headers and payloads. So message objects transit through these channels, and on the terminuses of these channels, there are components. And there is where you put your business logic. A lot of the business logic, a lot of the logic in those co components isn't really business specific. It's just uh, integration work. For example, you might use an inbound adapter on the, on the origin terminus, on the genesis terminus. You might have a, a, an inbound adapter that says, whenever a message comes in from a third party external system, I want to adapt it into a Spring Framework message. Maybe it's a XMPP message, or an MQTT message, or an AMQP message, or a JMS message, or a Kafka message, or, or a tweet on Twitter, or an email, or a new file appearing in, a, in an FTP server, or an SFTP server, right? All sorts of classic integration style stuff. And I can do the same thing in reverse. I can say, I've got a message, and I'm going to write it out. And I can even interpose other components that do things like splitting and, uh, and joining, or you know, aggregation, for splitting and aggregating uh, messages across different uh, queues, or I can transform them, enrich them, etc. This is all classic enterprise application integration stuff. In fact, the patterns, the API elements in Spring Integration map one-to-one -to, -one to the patterns uh, set forth in the canonical tome by Bobby Wolf and Gregor Hope called Patterns of Enterprise Application Integration. So there's that. I could use Spring Integration. It's certainly a, a good fit for what we're trying to do, but it's a little overkill because we're not going to use Twitter to connect our microservices, right? I'm not going to tweet to my reservation service that I've got a new, I've got a new post. I'm not going to send an email to that microservice either. I, I can take for granted that I'm going to use a message queue, a highly efficient, highly concurrent, highly transactional, uh, highly scalable, robust message queue. Something like Apache Kafka or Redis or RabbitMQ. These are all very, very, very easy to use, very easy to deploy, commoditized technologies uh, you know, that we all have, I'm sure, access to. So let's do that. Let's do that instead. And if, we, if we're willing to take for granted that we're going to use a message queue, then we can move up the abstraction stack a little bit. We can move up to something called Spring Cloud Stream. Spring Cloud Stream builds upon Spring Integration. It has the same idea of, as a message channel, and it has the same idea of messages. But it makes the work of composing these different uh, solutions a matter of convention and configuration. Our business logic, our Java code, interfaces and works with message channels with no regard to how those message channels are wired to the broker. That's left as a matter of convention and configuration uh, handled outside the code, right? Which means that you can arbitrarily reorder things later on, and that'll prove valuable, as we'll see in a little bit. Now, let's take a look at that, right? We're gonna use Spring Cloud Stream. I'm gonna say bringing, I'm gonna say bring in Spring Cloud Starter Stream Rabbit MQ or Rabbit. This is but one of many binders, right? Spring, Spring Cloud Stream has binder implementations. This binder is for RabbitMQ. There are binders for uh, JMS, for um, uh, Redis, for Kafka, Apache Kafka, uh, et cetera. So when I bring that in, I now have to tell my client, my reservation client, the edge service, I have to give it something to work with. I have to give it a message channel. And that work is declarative. I can define the channels here in an interface. I'm going to call this interface reservation client channels because it doesn't really matter at all. The, the name is completely arbitrary. And I'm going to create in this channel 
an output channel. Now, this is an arbitrary name. There's no reason you couldn't have multiple channels in the, in the uh, interface definition, each one of which is named for some downstream messaging-based microservice. You might have one for products, for orders, for customers, for whatever, right? In the same way that the service registry, Eureka or Console or Zookeeper, etc., act as a, a phone book for our REST-based APIs, so too does Spring Cloud Stream's interfaces act as a phone book for our messaging-based APIs. We don't have to worry about how or where these things live. We just know that if we send a message into this uh, output channel, that it'll get delivered to the downstream service appropriately. Right? And we'll talk about how that actually wire gets wired up and lines up later on. But for now, we've created an interface. And I can say reservation client channels class. There we go. So I'm saying enable binding. That's what activates Spring Cloud Stream. Once that's done, I can inject either this object or a ch an object of type message channel whose ID is type output. And I can dereference that channel. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to oh, inject here private final message channel out. And then I'll say that I want to use the message channel. I'll say message channel out this dot out. Uh, actually, I want the uh, reservation client channels. OK. So client channels dot output. OK. Et voila. So there's our output channel. Now I can use that channel in my code. So I need to create a message, a, sp a Spring Framework message, which has a payload of type string. And I'm going to use the Spring Framework message builder. And I'm going to say that I have a payload, reservation.get reservation name. That's the uh, string that I'm going to send to my downstream service. I don't have any headers, so I'm going to go ahead and just omit those. And then I can send the, uh, the message on the channel, like that. right? If I wrote that a little more cleanly, I'd say that. So I'm going to say, I've got a, a payload, the string name. I'm going to create a message around that, and I'm going to send it to the downstream service. Now, on the other side of the code, on the service itself, I need to do the same thing in reverse. I need to say that data is going to come in on a channel. And for this, I need to, first of all, reinstate Spring Cloud Starter Stream Rabbit. And I'll just bring in this other dependency so that I don't have to worry about it later on. Uh, and I'm going to bring it, I'm going to say, at enable binding. And I'm going to define an interface. I'll say, reservation reservation service channels and I'll say input subscribable channel input okay reservation service channels dot class and there we go so now I'm, I'm describing a channel that'll take data in and again the name is arbitrary I'm just using what I what I want now here we can use a spring framework or rather a spring integration component called a messaging endpoint it's just a declarative you know, uh, com processor. Data will arrive, and I'll process it as it arrives. It's a, you know, the Hollywood principle applied to distributed systems. Don't call me, I'll call you, right? So on new reservations, whenever a new reservation arrives, I'm going to coerce the payload. Uh, I'm going to have it injected or passed to my method uh, as a message whose payload is a type string. And I'm going to signal to Spring integration that data coming in from the input channel should be uh, passed to this method, right? So this is a listener, if you will, a message listener container. And what am I going to do with the message that arrives, that ultimately arrives? I'm going to write it to the database. That's what we're trying to do here, ultimately, right? So there we are. This dot reservation repository at save new reservation message dot get or get payload, and there we are. Okay. There's my message, uh, my message uh, processor, my reservation processor. So I'm going to restart that. Now let's take a quick look at the configuration that makes this possible so we can understand the dynamic of what's happening here. If we go to the producer, the producer is the edge service. I'm going to send data to the downstream service from my edge service. The producer has in its configuration here, spring cloud stream bindings dot output dot destination equals reservations. Output, my friend, is the name of the channel in the interface on the edge service, the client. This is arbitrary. If you have multiple channel definitions, you'll have multiple lines that look like this. Reservations is the agreed upon rendezvous point in the broker. It's where the, the producer and the consumer are going to agree to meet in RabbitMQ, in Apache Kafka, in Redis, in JMS, whatever, in a JMS broker. Yes? Well, we'll get back. let me get to that. The question is, is, it, is that the topic? And, um, and as it happens, yes. But Hold on. So let's look at the other side, the consumer now, the thing that accepts the data. You see, we can expect to see the, the same kind of thing in reverse there. We see this right here. 
It says spring cloud stream bindings input that destination equals reservations. That's natural. But one thing that we need to understand is that by definition, by, you know, by default, spring cloud stream bindings are publish subscribe. They're broadcast. They're one to many. They're topics, right? They're not point to point. So if I have 10 consumers, if I have 10 reservation services listening on the other end of my RabbitMQ, then all 10 of them will get the same one message if I send one message. That's not what I want here. I don't want to duplicate you know, the same message 10 times or n times. Instead, I want to do load balancing. I want to divide the work by as many consumers as I have. So if I have 100 messages that I send and I have 10 consumers, then each 10, you know, every one of those consumers should handle 10 different messages. So I need to make sure that the consumers divide themselves up so that only one consumer gets any one message. I can do this by using what's called an exclusive consumer group. Here I'm saying spring cloud stream bindings input, which is the channel still, dot group equals reservations group. Now all so configured consumers in the same group will arrange, as, or arrange themselves as an exclusive consumer group. Only one consumer will get the message at any, any given time. The final line of interest here is this. This, is, this specifies that the subscription to the configuration, or rather to the, con uh, to the uh, exchange and to the, to the queue should be durable. That is to say, if the broker has messages that haven't been delivered because the services are all down, then as soon as they start up, it's going to retroactively deliver all the messages that are in queue. That means that I can restart my service or I can have none of my services available and I still eventually will handle the data. They're not just island or stranded on the, in the broker. Okay? So these three things together give us the effect that we want. It's one-to-one, point-to-point, -to -point, as opposed to publish, subscribe. It's durable, so I'll, I'll retry the transactions as soon as the service becomes available. And of course, it's connecting to the right exchange. Now, uh, I've restarted the service. We should restart the client. I, I realize now that I forgot that. Okay. We can actually pop into RabbitMQ here on my local machine. 127.0.0.0.1 and it's called guest guest nope and I've got lots of different um, queues in here exchanges and queues where's my there we go this is the uh, queues so in RabbitMQ parlance how many how many of you have used RabbitMQ how many of you have used JMS okay so imagine uh, in, in the JMS world, you have a, a javax.jms.destination. A javax.jms.destination is, a, is a, a super type for two specific types of things, a javax.jms.queue and a javax.jms.topic. A topic is meant to be a pipe that has multiple consumers. A queue is a pipe that has one consumer. But otherwise, they're the same thing. They're both a type of destination. This, is, this means that the client or the consumer and the producer have to agree to meet at the same destination. In RabbitMQ, there is no such limitation. There's indirection even in the broker. In, in RabbitMQ, you publish a message to an exchange. The exchange is sort of the revolving door into the broker. And the exchange can do all sorts of cool things. It can do uh, replication to other brokers. It can translate the message from AMQP to another protocol. It can do all sorts of interesting stuff that has nothing to do with delivering it to a consumer. It can also act as a topic, for example, it can do point to point, it can do hierarchical topics as well, which you can't do natively in JMS. Uh, and the point is, the matching or the binding of the, uh, of the exchange to a queue is random. You can even change it at runtime. So I can have, uh, I can flip the train tracks, so to speak, in the queue it's, and the broker itself. So I have here the queues, and I can see here that the, the consumers are going to connect to the queues. This is the reservations group. And then I have the exchanges here. And uh, here I can see that I've got the reservations exchange. So the messages are going to arrive at the, res the topic exchange here. Then they're going to be sent to the exclusive consumer group. And only one, you know, one part, it'll be a partitioned consumer group, basically. OK, so let's see if everything's still working. There's the read. I'm reading data. OK. Let's send some data now. I'm going to send an empty, I'm going to send a post with some data in the payload. So uh, let's see. We're going to. Line this up, application JSON, not JSON, JSON, HTTP, localhost, 9999, reservations. Okay, 
and I'll say reservation name, and I'm going to send a few of my favorite doctors, because if, if we've established anything here today, it's that I love good doctors. Now, uh, I'm going to say Doctor Who, okay? And after I refresh, I can see Doctor Who be immediately reflected in the output on the edge service. So I did a post to the edge service. It delivered it to the RabbitMQ broker, which then was con the message was then consumed by the downstream service, the reservation service, which then wrote it to the data database, which then makes it available for me to refresh the browser and read it. Okay, uh, we can send some more doctors because we, we, we all love a good doctor. Okay, so Doctor Seuss and Doctor Strange. Okay, there we are. So there's all three of the good doctors. Now, let's go back and kill the poor, poor, poor reservation service, which for the balance of our talk is going to be killed a lot. So poor went out for the reservation service, okay? If I read that, if I refresh that, it's going to hesitate. It falls, the circuit breaker falls back. Now we're going to write some data. I'm going to write some data, and I'm going to say Dr. Subramaniam. Dr. Subramaniam, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam, is one of the coolest human beings you'll ever meet. He's a, uh, an amazing, terrific speaker, really, really nice guy, uh, and uh, just really, really genuinely cool. So you get a chance to watch any of his talks, you should. So Dr. Subramaniam. I'm gonna send Dr. Uh, Pollock. Dr. Pollock is uh, the co-founder of uh, Spring MQP, Spring Cloud Dataflow, and Spring XD. He is the founder of Spring.net, and he's a Spring Framework committer. So there's that. Also a super duper terrific guy. And uh, then we're gonna send Dr. Sire. Now Dr. Sire, uh, is the founder of Spring Batch. He's the co-founder of Spring MQP, Spring Integration, Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, uh, and uh, also a Spring Framework committer. So those three doctors have just been sent. Recall that we have a command line runner, and the command line runner is going to be rerun when the application starts, and that's in the reservation service. So you see that here. Here's all the names. This is an in-memory embedded database. So as the application starts up, it's going to recreate these 10 records. That's why we don't have 1,000 records by now, because I've been restarting the service. But it's discarding all of the names and then recreating them on startup. So what we're going to see is, as the application starts up, it's going to take delivery of those queued messages, those three messages that are waiting to be delivered. And then it's going to write the data, the, the command line runner. Or it'll probably do some mix of that. Maybe it's at the same time, because concurrency, right? So. Okay. Goody. So there we are. There's the good doctors. There are the good doctors. Doctors Subramaniam, Pollock, and Sire. They've been delivered. And then we saw the, the other command line runner written uh, records being writ written to the, to the database. We've now built a system, my friends, that does the right thing in the face of topology and service outages for both reads and writes. And it wasn't too much, too much code, but I would submit that it is still more code than I want to write. You see, the read use case had three lines. I was using the REST template. I created a parameterized type reference, uh, and then I uh, made the call with the REST template. Um, the, the write use case had three lines as well. I was using Spring integration and the low-level message channel and so on, and I was creating a message. We're not so bad, but consider that I'm only writing and reading a string here, right? Or a collection of strings. But really, uh, that's a lot of work. And it's going to become very tedious if every client that has to use the service has to write all of this code for both, for both the, the messaging and for the REST logic. One solution, and I say that with air quotes, uh, is for the, for the team that builds the service to write the client for that service. This runs the risk, however, of the client leaning upon the fact that they're also implement the, implementing the client and baking too much magic, quote unquote, into the client. The team that builds the service might use it as a crutch so a lot of organizations frown upon this. They say, okay, well, uh, you, we, we should be able to automatically generate the client, or the client should be built by somebody else. So Amazon.com, for example, says, if you're building an API, somebody else builds the client. That way, the service stands on its own. There's no magic in the client itself. And that way, anybody can build a client for a different language, as long as they ha have commoditized tools. Netflix, you know, they want the same, they want to make sure that that magic doesn't happen as well, but they're perfectly fine if uh, the client is automatic. That way there's no cognitive, uh, you know, overhead. There's nothing that you have to think about. It's just automatically done for you. And, the, and, and there's no problem if the service team ships that, so long as there's no, like, chance for inconsistencies and, and uh, special pathways. So let's take a look at how we can do that using, let's, have, look, let's take a look at building a declarative REST client using Netflix's Fane. Now, in English, Fane 
It means to pretend. It means to act as. So suppose you saw an animal in the forest. Do you have forest here? Is it, is it in the mall? No? Oh, it's on the top of the mall. Yeah, right. Makes sense. Ah, OK. Uh, suppose you saw an animal in the forest here, you know, laying supine with its tongue out, playing dead. It's trying to avoid, you know, entrapment. You'd say that that animal is feigning dead, right? It's pretending to be dead. In the same way that WebSphere feigns utility. It's not actually useful. It just pretends to be. So we can, do, we can use feign here. We can use feign to build a declarative REST client. I can say up here, at enable feign clients. And then I can build a interface, a declarative client. I can say reservation reader. And then I say feign client. And the client is going to uh, call for me my service, the same service that we've registered in the registry. So again, here too. Uh, here again, Spring Cloud has automatically wired, wired up this, this uh, client to know about Ribbon and to know about a registry for us. And I can now create a client-side method. I'm going to say that whenever somebody makes a call to the REST uh, service called the reservation service, and they call this method, we're going to create an HTTP GET call that goes to the reservations endpoint. And the return value will automatically be converted into, a spring, uh, into the Spring HiDOS collection of resources uh, whose payload is a type reservation. Now, with that done, I've got a client that I can use to talk to that service. And I'm using Spring MVC server-side mapping annotations on the client logic. I can now rewrite my API gateway. I can inject here in my code. I can re inject the reader instead of the REST template, uh, reader. And I can rework this code. I don't need that anymore, right? So I say a reservation reader, reader, this dot reservation reader equals reservation reader. Good. Much, much less code. Uh, we can see that here. I can change this logic. That all goes away. And instead of saying anything else, I just say read and get rid of that. So now it's become a one-liner. And, and even though it's not much less code, the real value here is that we didn't have to think about it. The client just works. We're not parsing the lines of code to understand what's happening. We know, oh, it's a feigned client. It's just going to work. Right? We, can, we can write tests for that, but that's not, we're not actually testing whether we've correctly manipulated the HTTP programming correctly, right? It's just a matter of whether we've got the right payloads and so on. So that's the REST stuff. What about the write? What about the write use case, the messaging code? Well, Fane doesn't quite work. It doesn't work for messaging. It doesn't know about RabbitMQ and Spring Integration. It's for REST. But we can use Spring Integration messaging gateways. Uh, messaging gateway is a, is a pattern, first and foremost. And it's the idea that you're going to have an object that hides the, the messaging, the inter interaction between the messaging systems behind what it looks like a synchronous method. It's a facade right, for the messaging code. So I'm going to say interface reservation writer. And I'll say void write string rn. And I'm going to signal to the signal to Spring Integration that this is a messaging gateway, and that this method should be sent on the request channel called output, which of course is the same channel that we have uh, defined by Spring Cloud Stream up here. So now, having done that, I can rework this code as well. I can get rid of the channel because I don't need it anymore, and I can just use the writer reservation writer reservation writer, and I'll say reservation writer. Okay, this dot reservation writer equals reservation writer. Good. Now we can get rid of this logic. It becomes markedly simpler, right? So this dot reservation writer dot write reservation dot get reservation name, or rather reservation dot get reservation name. Okay. So now it's the same business logic. I, I gain all the same benefits. I get client side load balancing. I get uh, I get messaging. I'm not using RPC. I'm still using REST, I'm still using ubiquitous transport, I'm still using highly decoupled interfaces, I still get uh, hypermedia so I can traverse the links if I want. Uh, I get all those benefits, but I haven't had to write so much business logic to get it. This is one of the pain points that people perceive when they move to a distributed systems world, is they think that they're gonna spend all their time twiddling HTTP packets and uh, twiddling uh, you know, with, with the message brokers, which is just not true. So there's the read, I'm, I'm correctly, correctly reading, right? That's working, let's go ahead and send some more data. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and send the good doctor's hire again a second time. And uh, when I go here, you see that the doctor's hire is there now. 
All right, good stuff, right? So now we've reduced the code. That was just a matter of style. It's not fundamentally anything new or a concept, but it's just a matter of making it easier. Now, now that we've got this up and running, that circuit breaker strikes me as an interesting opportunity. In this next section, we're going to talk about observability, and, and specifically, we're going to start with the circuit breaker. You see, that circuit breaker is a connective tissue between our client and the downstream services. It represents the connection from our API, from our code, to another API, not necessarily our own. The circuit breaker is very useful for services, you know, for, for guarding against failures in any system, of course, but it really comes into its own when you're using it to call third party services over which you have no control. You have no ability to inform or change uh, other people's operational characteristics for their services. You have no ability to, to make them run in Cloud Foundry to guarantee that the system is up all the time. You have no ability to influ influence all of that. So the best that you can do with a circuit breaker is to protect your system against their failure. That's what the circuit breaker does. And because it is basically, uh, a, it, it is, it, it, it's a stand-in, if you will, for their system. It represents the link to that system. And so monitoring the circuit breaker becomes useful because that is basically a, a proxy, if you will, for their system. If the circuit breaker says something is wrong, then it, it, is as, as, it is as good as saying that we have monitoring on their system and something is wrong, right? So let's, let's build a dashboard by which we can monitor the flow, the traffic, through that circuit breaker. We're going to build a Hystrix dashboard like so. We're going to use a config client and Eureka service registration discovery, and we'll hit generate. We'll open this up. Oh, did you hear that? Yeah. Oh. Okay, application properties, spring dot application name, name equals hysterix hyphen dashboard spring dot cloud dot config config dot uri equals HTTP localhost 8888. And I'm going to rename the property file to be bootstrap dot properties if I can type the right key. And I'll open up this code and I'll say, First of all, that I want to participate in service registration and discovery. So there's that. And I'll say at enable Hystrix dashboard. And then I'll restart. Now, what this is going to need is a service and event heartbeat stream. It's a heartbeat stream that every circuit breaker and all of the services and all of my system will automatically emit. That service and event heartbeat stream tells me the status of traffic through that circuit breaker. So let's visit the edge service. And we'll go to the circuit breaker stream for that edge service. You can see that this circuit breaker stream is, as I say, it's server sent event, it's push. There's always new data. It's endless. It's infinite. It goes on and on and on. It has no end. It has no finish. It is boundless, without finish. It goes on like the stars and the seas and the oceans and the bugs in your code, just infinite, just <laughs> on and on and on. So wh whatever you do, my friends, whatever you do, do not, do not, and I cannot underscore this enough, do not curl this endpoint. <laughs> now, we're going to take that endpoint and paste it into our Hystrix dashboard. And this dashboard is what we've just stood up. I'm going to paste it in there. I'm going to hit monitor. And now, if, as we draw, drive traffic on the left here, we should see, reflected on the right, the moving average. You can see that as I drive traffic on the left, it says 12, 19, 23, 30, etc. That's the ever arcing, ever upward trend of the traffic through that, that circuit breaker. Everything is healthy, everything is happy. Traffic is flowing just fine, and the circuit is closed. I can also see that there are 0% errors. Nothing is wrong, everything is healthy, okay? Now, if I kill my downstream service, here, we can see that the circuit breaker is going to eventually fail. It's going to open up, and you can see that 100% of the writes are go or reads rather are failing, and that we've got now this uh, ominous-looking red glowing orb. And now the circuit has eventually forced itself open, so it's going directly to the fallback. Right. So now you can see that that's happening. This gives us visibility into the state of the communication between these different services, and that's very important. Earlier on, we talked about the, uh, the actuator. The actuator is a good way to understand what's happening in a specific node, on a specific instance of a specific node in the system. But we haven't really looked at capturing systemic behavior. You have to remember that in a distributed system, the map is not the terrain. 
is if you are walking here in beautiful Singapore, is that exactly the same thing as looking at a map, a Google map of Singapore? Of course not, right? When you walk in Singapore, it's, first of all, it's markedly warmer. Second of all, the food smells much better than Google Maps does. It's much more beautiful, cleaner, it's amazing. You know, the, the people are amazing. There's, there's so much more happening in Singapore than you can actually understand or capture by looking at the map of Singapore. That's pretty obvious. What this, this is also true for distributed systems though. The, be, em, the emergent behavior of your system in production in the wild is very different from the architecture diagram of your system. The map is not the terrain. And you need to capture that emergent behavior to be able to truly understand what's happening. The circuit breaker dashboard is one way to do that. One thing you may be wondering, of course, is how do we get multiple circuit breaker dashboards, uh, you know, multiple circuits in a single screen? And of course, you can use Spring Cloud Turbine to do that. If you, do, if you use Spring Cloud Turbine, then it'll multiplex all of the circuit breaker streams into one unified stream that you can then plug into the dashboard and you can see that updated here. Right? So I'm not going to do that now, but it, it's, a, it's a fairly trivial exercise to then use Spring Cloud Stream to do that. Okay, Okay. so the next, the, another good way to capture the emergent behavior in a production system is to use distributed tracing. I like distributed tracing because uh, its appeal is obvious and it's such a big win when you do it. Distributed tracing is, in theory, very simple. What you want to do is to, for every message that flows through a system, from one node to another node to another node to another node, you want to make sure that you affix a unique ID, a unique identifier, a unique correlation ID, an ID by which you can trace the flow of that message. And so if a message enters in the Spring MVC REST API, and then it gets pushed to uh, RabbitMQ, or you send another message via the REST template, or a message arrives in the Zool microproxy, and then it goes to uh, you know, the, the RabbitMQ or Apache Kafka, or, or whatever. Any ingress and egress points in the architecture, any place where messages arrive or leave, you have to instrument that code to make sure that you check for this unique identifier, and if it's not there, add it. And if it is there, then make sure to perpetuate it so that as the message moves along, it always carries in band this one header, this one unique identifier. As long as you've got that, and as long as you've registered where this ID has been observed, then you can see the flow of the message through the system. And we already have that basic functionality working for us right now. I uh, sneakily added Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin to our application for both the, the client and the service earlier. They've been on the class path. They're dormant right now. They're on the class path. Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin is an implementation of an abstraction called Spring Cloud Sleuth. Sleuth, right? Sleuth is our distributed tracing uh, abstraction in Spring Cloud. Spring Cloud Sleuth, okay? Now, we've already got it on the class path, and it's already doing good work for us. We can see that here on the console for the client. Where is the client? Here's the client. Or is it doing good work for us? No, it's not. It's just sad. So I'm going to add it to the class path there, and we're going to sit here awkwardly waiting because I failed. Spring Cloud Sleuth has at its heart the idea of a trace. A trace is the aggregate journey. It's, it's the whole journey from A to Z of a request through the system. Uh, uh, uh. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. We ran. It wasn't me, man. It wasn't me. Ah, this poor guy. Um, a, a trace is the aggregate journey. It represents the aggregate journey of a, of a, of a message through the system from A to Z. If you have five services, then this, the trace ID will be the same across all five calls. A span, on the other hand, is each individual leg in that journey, each hop in the journey, from A to B, from B to C, from C to D, from D to E, etc. You'll have a different span ID for each one. What? But, 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 <laughs> it's static. I, I didn't even know that was a thing anymore. I've made this guy's life so miserable. Uh, so weird. 
Yeah, thanks, brother. Aw. <laughs> uh, <aww. laughs> um, anyway. The point is, that's already very useful, right? That, that abstraction is already useful. And here I've restarted the application. I'm driving some traffic now. And Spring Cloud Sleuth is already in play. And you can see it here on the console. You can see that it's, re it's got as its output the service ID. Oh. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Did I just. My code is cursed. This guy's my hero. We ran for president. I'd vote for you, buddy, I would. Sorry. Now's a good time to, to, to go pee. Uh, and if you have questions on, such, on some of the stuff that we talked about just up, up until now. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Yeah. You can do request reply based interactions with messaging as well. So that if you if you have a um, if you're using RabbitMQ or Kafka, it's very easy to say that there's a, a return address. What's wrong, buddy? Uh, your computer is eating up too much power. It, it's eating up too much power. Yeah. How? Can we use the VGA? You're, you're, oh, yeah. you, you're running too much applications or something. But I've done this demo a million times. Okay. Nothing has changed. I can, I, if, you, if you want to kill, it, kill my design and everything, and start again. Let me see, top, Java updater, Z shell, Java. So the Java processes are down here. Google Chrome is eating a lot of power. Goodbye. Let's kill some stuff. P kill Java. Kill all that. Okay. Top. I just killed all of the Java. Everything is sleeping. The only thing that's running right now is top itself. Do you want to try the other one, the VGA, or the HDMI, rather? No, I mean, sorry, the um, mini DV. No. Yes, sir? Um, so the... The, the history, okay, so let's talk about the circuit breaker, first of all. If you're using Cloud Foundry, you can do individually addressed, addressable um, instances. And for service-to-service -service communication in the cloud, you would still use Eureka, right? You're not gonna use, you're not gonna route back and forth between the, the different services through the, HA pro through the Go router, for example, right? So you'd still have uh, individual IPs on individual instances and you'd still do load balancing there. Uh, for iPhones and so on, for HTML5 devices, they're not going to use Eureka. Can I go again, or should I try? Okay. So. Uh, you're not going to interact with, um, you know, you're not going to, your, your individual, your client-side load balancing will work just fine there, and uh, Hystrix is going to work just fine as well, because it'll, it'll you know, there's nothing different. It's, it, as far as you're concerned, it's just two different services that are running on, in the cloud, as opposed to my local machine, but they, the, 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 the dynamics are still the same. Uh, what was the other, was there another part to the question? Actuator. Ah, so the actuator, again, 
those are host by host and node by node specific information. You can individually ad address some of them. Where, where you want or where you have uh, a need for global visibility, I've, ta I've talked about some ways to do that. I've talked about how you can capture some of that information uh, using, for example, the, the Drop Wizard metrics reporter objects that then publish those things to a, a shared uh, store. But a lot of that information doesn't need to be shared sing in a single place, right? That's, it's by definition a node by node kind of configuration. Uh, and, and we're looking right now at some information, some, some of these things that you can deploy uh, to, to centralize this information, right? The history dashboard and, and so on. And this all runs on Cloud Foundry. It's all just, it works just fine. In, indeed, uh, we've got work underway right now so that the metrics that are in, um, in the Spring Boot actuator can be used as a way of, of uh, as one of the ways by which we can do automatic um, uh, auto scale, right? And we've also got uh, work underway right now so that when you see, when your Spring Boot application says it's sick or it's down, then the ops manager will actually reflect that as well in Cloud Foundry, right? So this is a deep integration between Cloud Foundry and Spring. Okay, let me go ahead and restart the world. Config service. Okay, and we need the Eureka registry, so I'll start that up. Okay, and then we need the reservation service. Start that up. localhost 80 not, 87 hmm? 8030 what oh son of a gun <sighs> hmm Remember that earlier demo, much earlier? So I just opened up all my IntelliJs in the terminal on which that variable was set. And so all of them are seeing the overriding server underscore port equals 8030. So all of them are, that, that has priority over the built-in property file. So they're all trying to start on the same port. So now I have to kill everything. Echo server underscore port, not there, hooray. Okay, computers are terrible. Okay, so config service. Here we go, up, up, and away. And Eureka service, once that's up. Okay. And then we need the reservation service here. And that should spin up now, any moment. Localhost 8761. There we are, there's my service registry. Close this, and we should now see the reservation service itself eventually register there. <coughs> okay, now we need their client. Lo 
local host. 9999 reservation names. Okay, there's that. Now the dashboard. Histrix dashboard. There's that. Now, as I was saying before the uh, screen gave up the ghost, uh, I have on the console here, reflected in the output, logging that Spring Cloud Stream is automatically doing for us, rather Spring Cloud Sleuth. So we, here we see the service ID, the trace ID, and the span ID. And already this is pretty useful. I can drain my logs to a centralized log analytics platform uh, using, for example, um, Cloud Foundry's Logogator. Cloud Foundry will centralize, it'll take all the logs, multiplex them into one stream, and then drain the logs to any Sys syslogd compatible spout, anything like uh, Paper Trail or Splunk or Elasticsearch. And then I can do log archaeology, right? I can sift through the logs and see, uh, the, the, I can trace and find the, the, the flow of messages through the system. And that's okay. It's a start. But I'm a big believer that a picture is worth a thousand spans. So instead, we're going to go ahead and use Zipkin. Zipkin is an open source distributed tracing platform that originated at Twitter. I'm going to build a Zipkin service here. Zipkin server, config client, discovery client, and generate. Uh, it originated in 2010. It's a, it's a way of capturing and modeling and analyzing trace data. Spring cloud.config.uri. We are lucky, we are very fortunate on the Spring Cloud team to have committers from both Netflix and from Twitter, among others, who contribute to the team, to the code. So Histrix, sorry, Zipkin hyphen service. Okay, and we're gonna open up the Zipkin, oops, uh, gonna rename this file to be bootstrap.properties. Okay, I'm gonna say Zipkin service application. And I'll say at enable discovery client at enable Zipkin server. Okay, we'll spin this up. Now, by default, you'd probably have a, a backing data store, but in, in our case, I'm going to use the default, which is just in memory. When this spins up, it's going to start in port 9411 here, localhost 9411, or not. What did I do wrong? Do, 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 I don't have the Zipkin UI. Son of a gun. So let's see. Start.spring.io. Zipkin UI. Okay. This bit right here. Take two. There we are. Now, we have a distributed tracing platform, a distributed tracing service called Zipkin. As I say, it's an open source project that originated Twitter. We, uh, we have this running off to the side. It's not in the same process as any of our code. We have instrumentation, thanks to Spring Cloud Sleuth, uh, that, or we have listeners, thanks to Spring Cloud Sleuth, on all of the common places where messages enter or exit the system. And we then have an adapter, a listener, a specific type of listener, for Zipkin. But you can write your own listener if you want to, to capture that information. Our listener broadcasts all the trace information in the Spring Cloud Sleuth abstraction to whatever we want. In this case, it broadcasts it to a Zipkin. I'm using HTTP to broadcast. So Zipkin, the, ser the Zipkin service is itself an HTTP REST API. But I can also use Spring Cloud Stream. So I can publish uh, any trace information using RabbitMQ or Kafka and then have it delivered to the Zipkin Stream server instead of the HTTP REST API. Doesn't matter. We have adapters for, for both HTTP and messaging. The result, however, is that you get this pretty user interface. It's got some data. You can then analyze the data by looking at the bits. So let's go ahead and see this in action. I'm going to drive some traffic here on the left. I'll uh, send a few curls. And I'll say cat reservation name. And I'll send uh, Doctor Who again. Okay. Minus H, content hyphen type, application 
JSON, HTTP, localhost, and then it's a 9999 forward slash reservations. Okay, refresh that. So now I've, I've made some requests, both read and write. And if I refresh this, I can see that it is aware of our two services through which messages have passed because it has its Spring Cloud Starter uh, Zipkin on the class path. I can now click on Find Trace, and there I see a bevy, a plethora, a multitude of different traces. I can see that I made a request less than a minute ago. So let's click on that one for information. It has five spans, and when I do that, I can see that the total request time was 22.6 milliseconds, right? For the request that happens. Here's the nature of the request. Here's the breakdown of the individual hops in the request's journey. The way I like to read this is that the request at the reservation client was going to the reservation names endpoint, which was then going to the names endpoint at the reservation client, or the names method rather, which was then going to the HTTP reservations uh, endpoint from the reservation client, going to the reservation, sorry, the uh, Spring Data REST API on the reservation service. Right? I can see timings, relative timings. I can see that these timings are, you know, staircase. I'm not sure if you can see, but there's actually cutters here, right? This is Oh, well, that's a very saturated. Okay, well, just take my word for it. These are both colored, and by definition, these are wider than the blocks below them. So you can see relative timings. You can see when the messages started versus when the original message started. The original message started here, but Spring Data REST didn't get the message until uh, six milliseconds or so later on. Okay, I can click on each individual trace, each individual span rather, and I can get metadata. Here, for example, is the request log. It shows me that the message has arrived and you know, it was sent from this node in this port on the reservation client, then the uh, 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 received on this node, etc. And we can see the flow. We can also see service-specific information. These are called tags. These tags are, you know, this is HTTP-based information. I can also get the same thing for messaging, right? So if I go here and I say find trace, I can do a search here for the messaging input channel. And I can see that I made a request here for the good Dr. Sire. And I can see that that total transaction took 43 milliseconds. And I can see that the message started at the reservation client going to the reservation's endpoint, which then wrote it to the right method, which then sent the message here on the output channel. And then eventually, it was delivered here on the input channel. Now, in contrast to the other traces, there's a bit of a gap, isn't there, between output and input. Right? Can anybody tell me what that gap represents? Ne Sorry? Yeah, it's, it's in the broker. Right? That's the time it's transiting. So here, it left Spring integration, it left Spring Cloud Stream on the output channel. Spring Cloud Stream delivered it to RabbitMQ, then we lost track of it. We don't have instrumentation in RabbitMQ. Then it popped out the other end over here to be delivered to the reservation service, and then we, t we start the journey again. We see the story pick up again, right? So we can see that that, that gap represents the time it transited between, between one service to another in the broker. You don't, it doesn't say that it's RabbitMQ, but it's pretty clear that that's what it is. So you get visibility now. You get systemic behavior of what's happening. You also get this pretty graph, and I'm a sucker for, for pretty graphs. So uh, reservation service is used by the reservation client. It's been used 16 times. I get this nice ontology, that's cool. Now, <coughs> one thing we should underscore, this is not for customer service. This is not to, to figure out uh, what, did, what did Jane do on the website last year, right? This is about online telemetry. You're not gonna keep most of this data. Most organizations don't keep more than a few days, maybe a week at max, worth of data. Twitter, for example, captures one out of every few million requests. I forget the exact number, but it's more than a million requests. One out of every few million. They don't need to capture all of them. It's not like Pokemon. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can specify the granularity by, by configuring an object of type sampler. That sampler can do whatever you want. You can say, oh, this is an HTTP 200. The, six, the request was successful. There was no need to trace it. Or uh, it's a static asset like a JavaScript file or a CSS file. Don't bother. There's no side effects. There's no reason to trace that for example. By default, Spring Cloud Sleuth, which, which then of course informs what Spring Cloud Zipkin does, captures 10% of all traces. I'm doing a demo, so I have my configuration in the config server for Zipkin and for Sleuth to be 
but that's not a realistic uh, production deployment. You'll very quickly overwhelm your system. You're not trying to do this for customer service, like I say. <sighs> okay, so, so far we've looked ever so briefly at a, how to build a, a production-worthy service that lends itself to agility. We've looked at how to s benefit from the elasticity of a cloud and scale out. Uh, we've looked at how to do the right thing in the face of topology or uh, service failures. Uh, and we've looked at um, how to instrument both individual nodes and how to address observability. Now, I've got two more demos I'd like to show you. Do you want them? Should I just give up? I can give up if you want. We got, I wanted to talk about security, single sign-on between microservices. And <laughs> okay, uh, and then I wanted to talk about um, orchestrating messaging-based microservices. Now, the last one I don't really need to do too much at all because the one, the only, the amazing, my friend and my hero, Carlos, will be talking about that right after me. So he's not here. So don't tell him I said nice things. He can never know. Um, anyway, let's talk about security. In a distributed systems world, we have lots of different kinds of clients and lots of different microservices. Uh, and we want to make sure that access to these different microservices is secure. Fair enough. Good, good point, right? In a, in, a single, uh, in a single node system, you have to protect just that one node and everything that happens therein is secure. But that's not true anymore. Now you've got lots of nodes that all need to be secure and they have to, say, they have to share the same notion of identity, right? Uh, this gets more complicated when you introduce multiple kinds of clients multiple different types of devices, each of which has different guarantees that it can make for security. So the, co the problems become much more uh, sophisticated, more, you know, more uh, expansive, extensive, when you move to a microservices and a distributed systems world. We need, to have an, we need to have a single way to centralize identity information and then protect all these microservices quickly and easily with that information, with that identity provider. We also need to take into account the notion of a client. Because it's no longer enough to say, this is Josh. We have to say, this is Josh on his HTML5 browser or his Android device, right? Josh by himself isn't enough. One thing we could do, maybe, is use usernames and passwords. I'll have all the clients transmit in the headers a username and password, perhaps doing HTTP basic authentication. But that, wor that doesn't solve the client problem. It doesn't tell us who. It tells us who's accessing the service, but it doesn't tell us which kind of client. And it doesn't really help us because we've now made it so that all these different components are now passing around usernames and passwords, which is bad. It only takes one broken link, one insecure link for that password to escape. So you want to reduce the time where that service, that username and password, is visible. So what we're going to look at as, a, as an approach for some of these problems is, is something called OAuth. How many of you have heard of OAuth? OAuth is ubiquitous. It's built for it's a, it's purpose built for this kind of problem exactly. It's purpose built for distributed systems on the open web, and by that I mean HTTP based services. It works great even in, in your data center. Be, you know that's not open as well, but it's uh, it's purpose built to incor incorporate the notion of a client. OAuth has at its heart two things. It has the idea of a username, uh, you know, the user who is that making the request, and the client, and this is very very important. This distinction is very important. Imagine you're on the internet, and you see one of those um, one of those button. What's that called? Uh, Facebook. Sign in with Facebook. I don't use Facebook. I don't even have. I don't even know many people that do. That's why I'm so happy. Anyway, imagine you see one of those sign in with Facebook buttons, and uh, you click the button, and it redirects you back to Facebook.com in your browser and on your desktop. And it, when you're on Facebook.com, it shows you the certificate and the key, and it's HTTPS, it's server, you know, SSL. It's secure, baby. And then you, when you look at the page, it says, the page says, do you authorize this, this third-party service to you know, see your email information or get your, your profile information or post to your wall or whatever? To, it shows you a list of different things that it's asking you to approve. It says, do you... Do you want to spam your, fr your friends, your family, and your loved ones mercilessly and endlessly until such time as they hate you? And you say, yeah, do it, absolutely. <laughs> so you hit OK, and then Facebook.com redirects back to the third-party API, and suddenly that third-party service knows who you are. Welcome, Josh. Right? 
If you weren't already authenticated when you went to Facebook, it'll say you need to log in, right? And once you've logged in, then it'll show you the list of questions of the, the permissions that it wants. Then it redirects back. At no point, however, in that flow did you enter your username and password on the third-party website. You did it on the trusted Facebook.com domain. This is because that this is because Facebook doesn't trust that third-party service with your username and password. That's fair. They want to reduce the surface area of a possible attack. They have put a lot of money and a lot of effort into making sure that the pl only place where you put your username and password is encrypted and it's secure and it's super, super secure. Right? It's locked airtight. Once they redirect back to, your, to the third-party service, that third-party service doesn't have your username and password. It has a token. It's a string. It's an arbitrary string that the API, the third-party service, can then hand in for information. They can make calls to the third-party service, to the Facebook APIs, rather, on behalf of you. They bear the token on your behalf. In fact, that's what it's called, a bearer token. Okay? They bear the token on your behalf. So you have three parties here. You've got the identity provider, Facebook.com. You've got the, the third-party API, and you've got you. Right? And you is actually two things, and it's the client and it's you, the, the user. This is called three-legged OAuth. Right? This is very common for third-party services over which you have uh, no idea, no, co no control over the security, for example. And it's also common for things for, for which you don't trust the client. An HTML5 browser, for example, cannot be trusted to keep a secret. I can view source, so there's no point in making my JavaScript app identify itself I can, say, I can have a JavaScript app that says my name is the, HTML, is the uh, reservations Android or HTML5 device client, right? I can have that, but there's no point in, in further confirming that by making the, the client itself, absent, you know, forgetting about your username and password, there's no point in making the client itself uh, provide a password because you can just view source, right? Because the HTML5 browser can't keep as many secrets, it can't, keep, it can't make any, as many guarantees as something like a, a compiled, uh, signed, delivered on the App Store marketplace iPhone application, right? Because it can't make as many guarantees, maybe you say, oh, the HTML5 browser, uh, the client has less, uh, less freedom. They can, maybe they're only in read-only mode, whereas the, the device on this is multi-factor and it's thumbprint and it's compiled and all that. In this case, they get admin mode. Right? I'm, it's a silly example, but the point is uh, you can have different clients with different permissions, different roles, different scopes. That distinction is very important. Imagine now you're on Facebook.com's or you're on Facebook's app, the app on the iPhone, on the Android device. It's their native client. It's the client that they built. It's not a third-party API. It's not some other website that's letting you log into their website using Facebook's information. It's Facebook.com, basically. Don't you think it would be kind of a bad experience if you went to the app on Facebook on your, on, on your phone and it said, do you, and then it redirected you to Facebook.com asking you if you approve of Facebook having your Facebook information? Do you authorize Facebook to be Facebook? I mean, that would be a, a really bad user experience, don't you think? It doesn't make any sense either. Of course they authorize Facebook. Of, of, of course the people working at Facebook authorize the native client developed by the people at Facebook to access the information. They can already access your information, right? So they don't need to do the redirect. Instead, they just give you a username and password field. They're not worried about the password escaping. They can secure that, right? So this is a different kind of flow for a different kind of trust level and a different kind of client. OAuth can do all these kinds of flows and different intera interactions and many more besides, right? So with that in mind, we need to answer two questions. Who are the users? and what kind of clients are they using to, to, call, to call this uh, service? We're going to stand up a Spring Security OAuth based identity server, an identity provider. We're going to go back to start.spring.io, my second favorite place on the, on the web, and we're going to build something called the auth service. So I'm going to use Cloud OAuth. Okay? I'm going to use H2, the in memory embedded SQL database. I'll use JPA, the Java Persistence API, because I make poor life decisions. I'm going to use a config client and Eureka for service registration discovery. Uh, and then that I think I'll do for now. Now I'm going to go ahead and generate this. And what we're going to do is we're going to do two things. We're going to answer, first of all, the question about the users. This is just straight up old-fashioned spring security. There's nothing OAuthy about this. 
Spring Security, how many of you have used Spring Security? Okay, so, so the rest of you have as well, you just don't know it. Uh, Spring Security is the most ubiquitous security technology in the world. If you're building an application uh, on, the, on the JVM, there's nothing that even comes close to, in terms of the maturity and the robustness of Spring Security. Spring Security has been around for 11 years in some form or another, and Spring is itself the most popular technology on the JVM, which, which means that for, the, for half of the JVMs, more than half of the JVM's lifetime, Spring Security has been the only choice that is of, of reasonable use. There's been nothing before that, right? There, like the, the, the support for security in Java EE is a joke. There's nothing there. There's basic HTTP, basic uh, authentication, that kind of stuff. You have to use native proprietary plugins. So Spring Security has been very popular, and a lot of people use Spring Security even if they're not using Spring for other stuff. Like, you know, 10 years ago, if you're using struts, you could use Spring Security as a filter to secure your struts app, right? So what we need to do is to tell Spring Security about our application, about our usernames and passwords. And Spring Security has at its heart the concept of an authentication manager. An authentication manager is a generic thing. It says, given a request, we have to answer the question, is that request allowed to go through? Very, very simple. It delegates to a series of authentication providers. These authentication providers handle all sorts of different use cases. And you can configure your own, of course. Some of them will say, is there an X509 certificate in the request chain? If there is, maybe we can use that to figure out the user. And if, if we figure out the user, then we can answer the question based on that user's permissions. Or maybe there's a username and password, and it's an HTTP basic uh, you know, uh, um, authentication. Or maybe it's a, a form login. You've got a username and password field on a website, and you've posted it to some endpoint. Or something else. Maybe you've got an OAuth token. Right? Given a request, is that request allowed to go through? And if so, uh, you have to have a way of taking that request, identifying who's making the request, and then uh, so mapping that to some notion of a user. There's a specialization of this approach called a, called a user detail service. A user detail service is an interface. And uh, it has one job. It says, given a username, give me information about that user. And so we're going to go ahead and just build a very simple domain here. We're going to build a simple, simple JPA-based uh, repository to manage uh, a few simple records that I'm going to store in my little database here. Okay, so I'm going to say class account, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make it a JPA entity, so it'll be at, at ID, wrong one, at generate value, okay, and uh, we'll say at entity, and then we're going to say private string username, I'm going to say getter, and we'll have a constructor, and another constructor, this for JP and JP only, okay? And then a two string. Now, I want to be able to work with entities of that type, so I'll create a repository as we've done before with JPA and their J reservation. And I'll, I'll, I'll manage entities of type long, uh, account whose primary key is of type long. And then I'm going to provide my custom account user details service, right? It's a very simple contract, so we're going to do that here. We're going to say implements user details service. And again, Spring Security has a, 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 a uh, multitude of different implementations that you can already use that will talk to PAM or Kerberos or SiteMinder or Active Directory or LDAP or you know, anything, right? You don't need to use this homebrew style uh, uh, bespoke identity provider based on some table data that I'm going to store in JPA, right? You can use anything that you want. There's already in a binding for that. But as I don't have really the time or the interest to set up a, a SAML-based uh, environment for you right now, we're going to do this. Laziness trumps, uh, you know, thoroughness. Okay. So final account repository. Okay. Now what I need to do is I need to say, I need to answer the question. I need to say when somebody asks me for a user details object given a username, I need to return a value or throw a username not found exception. I can never return null. That's not part of the contract. The user details object in Spring Security is just an interface. It has uh, a collection of authorities or scopes or roles or permissions or whatever. It's random. It's, it's arbitrary. It changes from one backing identity provider to another. But it, suffice it to say that a granted authority is just a bucket for a string, which can be completely different from one system to another. And then we have the username and password. And then we have the, these booleans. And these booleans all mean the same thing. Is this 
a user allowed to, to keep using the system, right? There are different ways of phra phrasing it, but for our purposes, it'll suffice to map that information to a Boolean called active, right? Whoa. Sorry, password. There's this. I'm gonna have a Boolean here called Boolean active. Create a getter, there we are. So is active. So we're gonna map all that to the same thing. Uh, cheated a little bit here. String pw, this.password equals pw. Okay, and uh, create a toString as well. There we go, good. So now I need to create some sample data uh, and we also need to answer this question. We need to answer this question. So let me create some sample data first. Account CLR implements command line runner. So again, I'm just using this as an initialization hook. I'm gonna inject my account repository and I'm gonna say stream dot of, oops, constructor, stream dot of, and I'm gonna create some records. That's me, jlong spring. So my username, my username is jlong, my password is spring, pweb boot, desire cloud dot, and I'm gonna map each one. I'm gonna say for each string S, split it in half. So I'll have a tuple basically, a, a two element array. And then for each you know two element array, I'm gonna write some data to the database. I'll say account repository, let's save. Nope, not, not delete, save. New account. Okay. And uh, we're gonna to have to answer the question. I'm gonna say that the username is zero and the password is one, right? And I should probably have a second, a third field here for the is active Boolean. So let's go ahead and update our account entity here. Where did I put it? Okay. Boolean. Good, okay. So there we go. Now we have a very simple account object we're saving to the database. I've got a uh, uh, user detail service. We need to answer the question now. We need to say, when somebody asks, we're gonna have to find the user by username, find account, or find by username rather than it. So we're gonna create that method, passing in the username, and we'll have, we'll have that automatically added. In fact, we don't even need, um, what we need is an account, an optional of an account. Okay, so this is this is a, an optional is a Java eight ism. It says that I have an object that has that may or may not have an object inside of it. It's not null. It's a nice clean way to functionally work with that that the presence or the lack of presence of that of that data. So I can say, if the data is there, then I'm going to map from an account to a user details object, and we'll look at what that looks like in a second. Or, or, or else I'm going to throw a new username not found exception, right? So shruggy emoji. Okay. Good. So, okay, now, we can use a concrete implementation of the user details contract called a user. And here we're just going to pass in the username, the password, the uh, and then the the last the next four fields um, are oh yeah the next four fields are basically all the same thing is active right so this 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 and then the final field is a collection of roles or permissions or scopes or whatever. In, in my case, I'm just gonna go ahead and give everybody an account. It's like the best episode of Oprah ever. Look under your chair, everybody. Look under the chair. You all get a valid account, okay? Now, once I've done that, I've taught Spring Security about my users, and it's a simple ad adapter around the stable database table I've got. Not a big deal, but it's there. Now we need to teach Spring Security OAuth about our clients. We need to actually turn on Spring Security OAuth, so that actually turns out to be fairly simple. We're gonna we have to say uh, OAuth configuration extends authorization server configure adapter. And the configure adapter is just a, a no op implementation of three configuration callback methods. And you can implement uh, whichever ones you want. We don't need this one. 
we're going to say at enable authorization server, and this is a configuration class, of course. And we're going to tell Spring Security OAuth about the users in our system by giving it a pointer to the authentication manager from Spring Security. Right? We want it. We want Spring Security OAuth to just share the information that Spring Security already has, which may not always be the case. Let's change this constructor here. Okay. So we go down to the endpoints thing. We say endpoints dot authentication manager. This dot authentication manager. There we go. And now we need to describe the client. And I can have as many clients as I want. I could load this information from a data source. I could use another JP entity. I could do whatever I want, right? If you ever go to developer.facebook.com or developer.twitter.com or whatever, it, you can register new clients there, right? Well, in this case, I'm just gonna have a static fixed list of uh, clients that I'm gonna store in memory. So I'll say with client, and the client's gonna be called Acme, although maybe it should be called reservations, HTML5 client or whatever. Uh, and then the password will be, or rather the, um, Authorized grant type will be the password flow. So I'm not going to require users to uh, to do, do the redirect back to Facebook.com. I'm going to let them pass in a username and password like Facebook.app on the phone. Uh, the scope that I'm requiring, the, the, the only allowed permission that I'm going to give out is something called OpenID, which is completely arbitrary. It could be post to wall or tweet or you know access your email. It's up to you to provide a valid definition for a scope. And here, I'm going to say that my client has to present a client secret. But again, HTML5 devices may not be able to do that. So it doesn't make sense necessarily for every kind of client. OK, now, the final thing we need to do is we need to provide a token URI or token info URI. So, so think about how this is going to work. We're going to lock down our reservation client, the edge service. When the reservation client sees a request, it's going to see if there's a token. If that token is present, it's going to then call something and say, what does this mean? I've got a token. Is it valid or not? It doesn't know that. It's going to call our authorization server. right? The, presumably, the client has gotten the token from the authorization server. So we, we need to teach the authorization server how to translate a token for a principle, a Java security principle, java.security.principle. This endpoint is different from each for each OAuth authorization service. Facebook's token info token info endpoint is different from Twitter's. For, for, for Facebook.com, the API, it's called forward slash me, right? But of course, it has information about your friends and your timeline and so on. That's very different from the information from Twitter. And, that it, and it's very different from this information. So it has to be, it has to be you know, OAuth implementation specific. There's no standard OAuth uh, info endpoint. So you have to provide that yourself. Ours is going to be very boring. We're going to have a REST controller, at REST controller class principle rest controller and we're going to say that whenever somebody makes a request to forward slash user we're going to return a principle and the way we're going to return a principle is just by taking in the principle that's given to us now this is a bit weird at first blush very confusing what i'm going to do is i'm going to go up here i'm going to say at enable resource server this this tells spring security Spring Cloud Security, that whenever it sees an access token, it should turn it into a Java security principle. Well, in this case, we want that principle so that we can turn it into JSON so that we can give it to the third party API. So we're saying whenever somebody authenticates this, uh, whenever somebody sends a, a request to the user endpoint on the authorization server, if there's a token in the request, turn it into a principle. And all we want to do is give it back to the client so that it can then use that uh, to figure out whether this user is allowed to access the reservation client or anything else. I know, a little, little mind-bending, but it, it's, it's what we're doing, okay? So I have this application configured, um, springcloud.config.uri equals HTTP localhost 8888 spring.application.name equals uh, auth hyphen service. And we're going to rename this property file to, to be bootstrap.properties. Et voila. OK? Once this starts up, it's going to look at the configuration from the config server, and it'll start up on port 9191. And all requests to the auth server are going to be, uh, it's going to have a context path of forward slash uh, UAA. Right? I've just done that in the configuration. So now, in order for the token exchange endpoint to work, somebody would have to make a request to UAA forward slash user, for example. Okay, so this is up and running on this port. Let's go ahead and change our reservation client now. Let's make the reservation client um, 
protect itself. Let's make the reservation client smart enough to reject requests that don't have a valid token as they were vended from this authorization server. So we're going to say Spring Cloud Start OAuth 2, same as before. And this is going to lock down our reservation client, our edge service. The configuration will be active once we say at enable resource server. So there's this. So we say at enable resource server. We're going to start the we're going to restart this, and then we can go to this uh, browser plugin called the Postman browser plugin, and we're going to send a request to the edge service, and ask for a token. So I'm going to say localhost 9191 UAA token, and I'm going to send requests. I'm going to send a request uh, that has an accept header of application JSON, a SHA encoded HTTP basic username and password, and then in the body of the request, since it's a post, I'm going to send the password, which is spring, the username, which is jlong. I'm asking for a certain type of flow to be authorized, the, the uh, uh, in password grant type. I want the scope called open ID. The client secret is called Acme secret, and the client ID is called Acme. Okay? If any of these things don't line up with what the, com the client is configured to give on the service, then there's not going to be a valid token. So I'll hit send, and we can see that the authorization server gave me this access token. This access token is a type of bearer. Okay? And if, if we've done everything right on the client, we should be able to use it now. So curl minus curl HTTP colon colon forward slash forward slash uh, 9999 forward slash reservations forward slash names. So this should fail. Uh, uh, full authentication is required to access this, this endpoint. Good. Let's try passing in the authorization header. Bearer paste. That works. Right? Now let's prove the negative. Let's prove that I'm not just getting lucky. I'm going to tamper with a token. And now it says invalid token. Okay? So I've now locked down my edge service. The way that the edge, ser the, the edge service knew what to do, because if you look at the configuration here, I've got this one attribute here that says security OAuth2 resource user info URI equals localhost 9191 UAA user. So when the token arrived at the edge service, it said, oh, I don't know what to do with this, but I've got this, I've got this link that tells me to go to the authorization service and to exchange it for a valid principle, which it does, and then it uses that to figure out what to do. Okay? So now we've locked down our services, and we can use this. We can inject in our reservation client now. We can inject the Java security principle in any of our handler methods. Now we can see that Josh is making the request as opposed to just asking for a random collection of reservations. Okay, good. So now we've got a very simple edge service. Now let's talk about uh, orchestration. Eh, 10, 11, uh, 12, 12 minutes, 12 minutes, maybe 15. What? Are you okay? They, I, told, I, 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 I thought I told you to lock the doors. Lock them in. Okay. So. Ever, ever so briefly, let's turn to the last thing, which is orchestration of distributed messaging-based microservices. Uh, earlier, we, we saw that Spring Cloud Stream makes it easy to build a system com you know, uh, composed of small, singly-focused components that are connected by a RabbitMQ broker or an Apache Kafka broker or Redis or whatever. We can, we've standardized or commoditized the transport of messages between services. We don't, know, we don't care about the, the, the way that these things are sending data. Instead, we care about the payload of the data, not the actual transport. As long as we're using HTTP, as long as we're using AMQP, it's all the same. This, this, isn't, this doesn't change from one service to another. Gazoon. If we don't care about that, then we can do interesting things because we can orchestrate higher level, more complex solutions based on these small, singly focused services. In the same way that when I go to the command line, I can say curl, you know, food at, or, you know, cat food at txt, pipe, grep, get some data, you know, and then out that to uh, results.txt, right? I'm building interesting solutions by composing small little services and then passing them through a commoditized, standardized transport. In this case, standard in and standard out, as modeled by the pipe operator in the bash DSL. We can achieve the same effect for our messaging-based microservices. We've got a simple one here that takes messages from the input reservations uh, thing and then writes it to our database. Very, very trivial. But we can now reuse that. 
right? Now, I could create another service and use Spring Cloud Stream itself, but we have an, another opportunity. We can move even further up, up, up the abstraction stack and use Spring Cloud Dataflow. Spring Cloud Dataflow is an operator's uh, uh, approach to, to building interesting solutions, stream processing solutions. I, I spoke earlier about the sensor network here in Singapore. That data is infinite. It doesn't stop, right? There's, it's, not like the, it's not like the streets just stop working. It's not like it's a, a batch job. It's not like the streets only work from eight to five. As long as there are streets, there are gonna be sensors and there's gonna be data. So that's not really suitable for batch processing. This is something that's an infinite workload. There's always gonna be new data. So you can use Spring Cloud Dataflow to build stream processing solutions, solutions that never stop. Data flows through these different components and they get routed accordingly. And because we're using Spring Cloud Dataflow to create arbitrary solutions and integrations, we can reconnect these different components. Remember I showed you earlier, the Spring Cloud Stream binding is in the configuration. I can change the configuration and suddenly the messages that are leaving one bit of code go to another one. Right now, they're, they're, the reservation client is set up to talk to the reservation service but there's no reason I couldn't introduce a third thing in the middle because there's nothing in my Java code that forbids that. It's just about properties in the property in the configuration server, right? As long as I change that and restart, restart the, the flow is now different, right? So if we understand that approach and we understand the potential, let's go see it in action. I'm going back to start.spring.io. I'm going to build a data flow service. And I'll say data flow server config client Eureka discovery and generate. So, Oh, Santa Maria. Oh. Okay. Application.properties. Come on, computer. There we are. Spring.cloud.config.uri equals HTTP localhost 8888 spring.application name equals, uh, what are we doing? Dataflow service. And we're going to rename this property to be uh, bootstrap.properties. And then we're going to open up the data source, data flow application. I'm going to say at enable data flow server, at enable discovery client. And then we're going to start it up. Now this data flow service could use a database. Well, I don't have a database right now, so it's in memory. But you can use a stored database. And we, we use a shell, a very similar shell to, to the bash uh, shell, for example, to talk to the data flow service. So I've got uh, a shell jar here. You can get your own shell. It's obviously. Uh, in fact, you can use Spring Boot to create your own shell, but there's no reason to. It's just something you can download or brew, install, and homebrew. Uh, here's the 1.0 jar for the shell. I can just download it. Uh, and then I can say java minus jar shell.jar. It's a Spring Boot app, of course, Spring Shell application. And now Dataflow is connected to my service. But my service has no streams registered. It has no modules. It has no apps. It has no tasks either. I can use Dataflow to orchestrate tasks as well. So a task is a, a batch job. It's something that has a well-known start and stop. Whereas a stream is something that is infinite. It doesn't stop. But you can orchestrate and describe and launch arbitrary compositions of these different tasks and streams from Dataflow from the shell. So I want some, I want some services. I want some apps. I have nothing here. These are, there's no Lego bricks. I have no primitives on which to build interesting services. I could, of course, model my own, I can create my own. Spring Cloud Stream apps are the basis for Spring Cloud Dataflow apps, right? So they're just, they're just apps that send data on well-known channels or receive data on well-known channels. So let's see, github.com, beautiful microservices, sorry, Cloud Native Java. Okay, T, D, F, shell, nope, beautiful microservices. Config, T, D, F, shell, commands. So the first command that I'm gonna run is this one. I'm gonna import the Maven coordinates. This is just a, a URL that has a, a text file that has the Maven coordinates for a whole bunch of pre-built components that you can use in your Dataflow applications. I just like having them around because it's nice to have a richer toolbox. But again, there's no reason you couldn't just register the ones you care about and ignore the others. So now if I do app list, I can see four types of components have been registered here, right? I can see that there are sources, processors, and syncs, and tasks. A source is a Spring Cloud Stream app that sends a message out on an output channel called, guess what, output. It's literally that. It's as simple as the one I built earlier. A processor is a Spring Cloud Stream application that has both input and output channels, one called input, one called output. 
That's all. And a sync is a component that takes data in on a well-known channel called input. And I have some pre-built Lego bricks here. I've got, a, for example, a source that will monitor a directory for a file. And, I, and then I can take the data from that file and then pipe it to another component, and then filter it, and then pipe it to another, thing, com another component. In my case, I just want to, let's say, monitor a directory, and then divide the file in terms of the lines, you know, divide, split it by the lines, and then send each one of those lines to my reservations endpoint, my messaging, my messaging uh, service. So I can say, here, I'm going to create a stream definition that does just that. So, stream, this says stream create, the name of the stream is called files to reservations. The definition is as follow, I'm going to use the file source, the source is going to have a few different Spring Boot properties, these are just, these are just Spring Boot properties, the same thing as you would put an application that properties in your own code. Uh, and so I'm going to say that the mode is lines and the directory is equal to users jlong desktop in and then I'm going to have that routed to the Spring Cloud Stream destination, just like I saw in the configuration for the config server. Spring Cloud Stream bindings dot output dot destination equals reservations. And then I'm going to deploy it. Okay. Now, when I say deploy, what I mean is that Spring Cloud Stream, Spring Cloud Dataflow rather, has started a Java process and it is monitoring that Java process here. That Java process, of course, is the file source. So I've got an actual thing. There are different Spring Cloud Dataflow. Uh, um, deployers you can run on, on Cloud Foundry, for example. And instead of running local jobs, it'll start new Cloud Foundry applications. So here's standard out. You can see that it's just a regular Spring Boot application running on my machine, monitoring that directory. So let's go to that, let's go to the desktop here. And you can see on the desktop, I've got now an input directory. I've got an in directory that was just created. There's nothing in it. So let's open up a text file here. And we're going to say, uh, I need some names. So we're going to say uh, Jade, Sergio, Carlos, <coughs> Josh, um, Michael. That's enough. That's, that's, uh, save these names here in the input directory. Okay. I'm going to save these in the in directory as uh, in.txt or, you know, pivotal.txt. Okay. Let me get up my browser here so I'm ready to do this before I save. Localhost 9999, reservation names. Oh, right, it's not uh, secured. Uh, curl, where's my authentication token? Mm. I need the token from the endpoint. So we'll go here, grab this. Before I save it, I want to get this all lined up. So curl minus h authorization bearer paste http localhost 9999 forward slash reservations names. So there we go, that's working. Let's go ahead and now save this file, pivotal.txt, and then run the command again. And there we can see it says Jade, Sergio, Carlos, Josh, Michael, right? So now, instead of me writing low-level Java code, I can reuse these little components. My messaging-based microservices can now be composed together in arbitrary combinations, and I can scale them out individually. I can scale them out as Cloud Foundry applications, right? Each, each, each shell, each component in that stream definition can be scaled out differently, right? Okay, now we've only touched on just a few of the things that you can do uh, with Spring Cloud today. I feel like if we had more time, we might be able to really to get into some real stuff. You know? Today was, today was a little too quick, a little too shallow. I don't feel like we covered anything really at all. But maybe next time. Maybe next time, maybe with some more time, we can, get, we can really chew off some meaty topics. Now, uh, I hope you appreciated some of what we talked about today. Did you like any of it? Yes? Very good, I'm happy to hear that, it makes me happy. Uh, I certainly like this stuff, of course I like this stuff. I'm wearing a spring t-shirt and spring underwear, of course, that, of course I'm a big fan. But you don't have to take my word for it, right? <coughs> Remember, the name of the game here is agility. The name of the game is to expedite the movement, the progression from product management all the way through to production. How quickly can you do that? A lot of organizations have struggled with this. Some have struggled and innovated, and some 
uh, understand the importance of this and they've done whatever they can to go faster. So there are organizations uh, that are using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud right now. They're starting new projects on it. And there are existing organizations, some of whom are very successful and very big, that are also using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry to go faster. Uh, there's a small company in Los Altos in, in California called Netflix. Netflix is using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at scale, one of the largest websites on the planet. They have talked about the use of Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Uh, in neighboring China, in next door China, there's a small company there called Alibaba. <laughs> Alibaba had a single day last year where they had 14 billion yuan, Chinese yuan, I think, in a single day. Billions of dollars of value in a single day, 24 hours. Forget about web scale, China scale, right? <laughs> they are using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at extraordinary scale, and they've talked about that as well publicly. Baidu, neighboring and also in neighboring China, they're a small search engine, the, th the third largest in the world after Google and Bing. And of course, Bing powers uh, Yahoo, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, they don't matter. <laughs> so, so it's, so Baidu serves something like 600 to, uh, 400 to 600 million Chinese users every day. And they're using Cloud Foundry, Spring Boot, and Spring Cloud. There's, uh, uh, if, if, if Amazon.com is Alibaba for the West, then certainly Rakuten.com in next door Japan is Alibaba for the further East, right? And they're using Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry at scale, right? These organizations and many others besides have the money, the motivations, the resources, the brain trust, the people, and the need. They have every reason to solve these problems, and if they didn't have these technologies, they would have solved it themselves. And indeed, some of them have solved parts of it themselves. It is by the good graces of Netflix's generosity that we can all build upon some of the Lego bricks, some of the foundational elements that they've open sourced and then we've integrated and made uh, cohesive in Spring Cloud. But even Netflix is using Spring Cloud, not just the constituent components, because this is far more integrated and far more uh, productive an environment, far more productive an experience. Right? And that's the goal here, is to be productive, to make short work of the non-functional requirements that gate our ability to deliver value to the customer, which is, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters. So I'm happy to take questions if you've got them now. I'm going to put up that, uh, that slide. Remember that slide I told you in the very beginning that you're going to want, you should record? I even described it as a life vest in an ocean. Well, this is that slide again. Right? Uh, the, uh, the workshop up here, my friends, that workshop is a three-day lab. It has instructions and exercises all in that, op in that open source GitHub repository that you can just follow along with. Uh, in that workshop, we cover most of the stuff that we've talked about just now today. So you can now, uh, now that you understand the motivations and the why, now you can uh, hone in on the specifics and the how. Right? Uh, I'm not expecting you to remember everything that we've just done today. I almost don't remember everything we've just done today. But I expect you to know why, why these things matter, and that it's possible. right? that there are solutions out there that, that work for this use case. Uh, there are also, I should change this, I'm gonna change it right now. There's also a great resource in spring.io forward slash guides. Okay. There we go, so I would definitely record that as well, whoa. Remove the links. Okay. These guides are focused uh, 10 to 15 minute long uh, introductions to one thing and one thing only and all manner of different topics. Uh, you'll edit link. I just want this to go away. Okay. You'll find guides on, on all manner of different things, be it REST or messaging or big data or integration or security or, or anything, and far more stuff than I've talked about today. You'll find guides on circuit breakers and client-side load balancing and centralized configuration and service registration and discovery and, and again, so much more. So I encourage you to follow those. Those guides are meant to be nauseatingly simple. Exhaustive uh, is not the name of the game here. They're supposed to be 
Super, super simple. The goal is just to see something work, to, to make it wiggle. You want a simple REST API? It'll show you how to create a simple REST API with one endpoint. You can build the all singing, all dancing demo from there. And you've seen me do that today. This stuff is iterative. I've layered on support for different concerns as I needed to. But you don't have to chew off everything at the same time. You can take, pick and choose the bits you care about. Okay, my friends, if you have any questions, I appreciate it. Uh, otherwise, let's make way for our next presenter. And uh, uh, thank you so, so much for all your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> and also, thanks for, thanks we read for, for making the, the, the AV work. Uh, I, that was, yeah, seriously, thank you.